and you're looking live at Crew 6 on the move inside astronaut crew quarters. The three astronauts and one cosmonaut finished putting on their spacesuits in the historic suit up room and now they are walking down the hallway to the elevator. In front, Commander Stephen Bowen and Pilot Woody Hoburg. Behind them, Mission Specialist Sultan al Nayadi and Andrei Fedyeyev. They are getting into the elevator to the first floor where they, where they will begin their journey to space. That and more is coming up next. Now you're looking live at the Crew Dragon spacecraft on top of a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket that will launch the Crew 6 crew to the International Space Station in a little more than three hours. Welcome to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida for live coverage of NASA and SpaceX's launch of Crew 6, now streaming in 4K. I'm NASA's Daryl Nail, and with me is NASA astronaut Raja Chari, back by popular demand. <laughs> Thanks for coming back. Yeah, glad to be back, Daryl, and hoping the second time is the, is the charm, and hoping to see my first launch. Absolutely. We're excited to get your reaction on that. In addition to Raja's analysis, we have live updates from Mission Control in Houston and live interviews from our VIP location here at Kennedy. There you see them. Hello, Houston, and hello, Jasmine. And later on, at T-minus one hour, we will welcome in SpaceX live from Hawthorne, California. But let's begin quickly with a recap of the first launch attempt early Sunday morning. The day started here with the crew signing the mission patch inside crew quarters at the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building. They went through the entire process of suit up and transport to the pad where they ingressed into the Dragon capsule. The countdown moved along smoothly until reduced flow in an engine ignition fluid line was detected by the launch team. The launch was scrubbed with less than three minutes in the count. The astronauts remained in the capsule until the rocket was completely detanked. A disappointing moment for the astronauts, certainly, Raja. Yeah, I mean, I think they're obviously like an instantaneous, uh, you know, instant of a uh, little bit of disappointment, but obviously the right, safe thing to do, uh, and the team all knows that, and so they're ready to, ready to do it again today and uh, have learned from all that and some great lessons learned. And now we want to focus on the front doors of the astronaut crew quarters where those astronauts are ready to walk out. We saw them briefly in the window, and they are ready to go just momentarily. Be doing it for a second time. Yep, and we see the uh, the stickers around the outside, there, so they got a chance when they came back from the scrub to smack their uh, Crew 6 sticker on the way in, so some extra luck for tonight. Absolutely. And we're going to try and give them some more good luck along the way. We'll have more about that later in the show. You see the sign above them with the names of Crew 6. Yep, and, uh, and one of the reasons we didn't show some earlier suit up tonight was uh, because it's our second. And here they come. Crew 6 walking outside of astronaut crew quarters for the second time, hoping to make the flight happen. Four on countdown. Crew walk From out. left to right, crew displays. Yeah. Crew displays. Andrei Fedyeyev, Woody Hoberg, Stephen Bowen, and Sultan Al Nayadi. Getting some high fives there. Yeah. 
So you can see in the background there, the, uh, the SpaceX personnel getting ready to take them out in their Teslas. They're pre-positioning their cooling packs in the vehicles. Sounds like our microphone is close to the mission specialist. It is, yep, close to the UAE area. We're looking at uh, Captain Bowen, huh? There's Andre, so a, a great chance for the, the friends, family, loved ones to come out and say, say uh, good luck and see you later uh, to the astronauts. You saw the administrator Nelson and Pam Mulroy down at the end there. The, the back of her head and then the administrator just to the right of her. So Raj, this is the second time they're doing this. What's the kind of the mindset now is, as you see your family now for the second time? <laughs> it's, it's actually kind of nice because you get a little bit of time in between that scrub and this time to have, you know, you know, you build up to a lot of it thinking you're not going to have a whole lot of time and then you get a little bit of extra time with your family. And I sorry, I misspoke. That wasn't Pam Muller or that's Katie Maynard down there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's actually, uh, it's definitely busy. Uh, so inside crew cars, we can talk about that later. There's there's plenty of sims in there, but it's a nice chance to have a few more hours with your family on Earth. And you were able to have some communication with the commander during the downtime. What uh, what did he say about kind of their mindset? Well, so Steve uh, commented that this is you know essentially all in a day's life. Uh, Woody pointed out that this is almost like a free training sim for him. So mm. and that's kind of one of the reasons we saw them ahead of timeline tonight in the suit up room is they've done it all before. So a lot of uh, doing something the second time makes it a lot easier, so they essentially had another another free dress rehearsal to practice it all. There's Woody Hoberg, the pilot for Crew 6, giving the wave. You can see there's a sense of familiarity as they get into the Teslas. Yep, and now you can see Administrator Nelson there, uh, the bottom right, and then Bob Cabana's just to his right. And I think that's Calvin Manning to his right, the Deputy Kennedy Center Director. So definitely a, a sign of the importance of this mission to have uh, all the headquarters folks come down here, stay down here. Uh, the crew's not the only ones who stays down here between scrubs, they do too. So it's uh, all hands on deck. So the second Tesla, the doors are closed for the commander and the pilot for the mission and behind them, the mission specialists. And that second Tesla, they also include the flight surgeon. They ride along and then in the third Tesla, those astronauts are with a second closeout lead they take uh, some of the closeout team with them on the way to the pad. And take a look at the license plate. We saw this last time. Crew Dragon with a number six for the G. Yeah, and, and this time I know. So last time I was surprised to find out that it changes each time. <laughs> I was thought that it always said send it with a three. But it turns out that was only for Crew 3. So Crew 3 <laughs> was a special <laughs> <It> mission. Was, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not Maybe special enough for, uh, to put it on every single. Maybe I've been watching that video too much. <laughs> <laughs> You see uh, Nora is at the back of that third car. She's uh, in the new class of astronaut candidates from the UAE. Training with who we call the Flies, which is the 2021 class. Ah, uh, yes. New partnership with the UAE for commercial crew. And now the families get to go up to the window. Yep, and they just saw Haza leave the frame, who was the first astronaut from the UAE. Uh, to go into space, and then he and Sultan actually trained together in Russia, and then Haza has been Sultan's backup here in the U.S., so uh, a long partnership between the two of them, training together both in Russia and here. And we'll hear from Haza a little bit later on in the show. Our own Jasmine Hopkins is uh, going to be interviewing him again tonight. Look forward to getting the words from him and find out if he was able to catch up with S Sultan in the, uh, in the interim. So uh, the final chance here, so while when they get in the Teslas there, they actually hook them up to cooling boxes. So I mentioned before, you saw the SpaceX people kind of going behind the scenes. They get those positioned in the Teslas, so that's why there's some more time, and they use every second they can to talk to the families, which is why they have the windows down, still chatting with them, while the flight docks connect their suit umbilicals to those cooling boxes. That essentially just uh, pumps cool air into the suit, because in the, the warm, humid Florida weather, it can get somewhat sweaty in there if you don't have some cool air flowing through it. Right, especially in the tight space. Exactly. Did you roll down your window when uh, you were riding out? I, I saw during demo two, Bob and Doug rolled down the window briefly. We did uh, initially, but I put them up uh, once we got going. And here we go with the crew departing the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building. This begins the 20-minute drive with a full security escort 
across NASA's Kennedy Space Center to launch pad 39A. And they're firing up the playlists right now, Raj, as you know. In that yep. first car, if you want to look up these songs and get the vibe of what they're listening to, well, Stephen and Woody are listening to Traveling Band by Credence Clearwater Revival, May We All by Florida Georgia Line and Tim McGraw, The Space Traveler's Lullaby by Kamasi, who's an American jazz saxophonist, Sing Me to Sleep by Alan Walker, Spaceman by Harry Nielsen, and then the second car, They got quite a playlist as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what did you listen to? So this is a collabor. It was a collaboration. So uh, Tom and I were in the first car, and then Kayla and Matthias had a mix of uh, U.S. and German songs. Uh, so it was, was it's like you said, it's it kind of the emotional setup for the ride. Uh, I think the other benefit of uh, Scrub uh, is we had the benefit of having uh, multiple trips out there. Is that the person uh, who's your DJ has a chance to actually <laughs> zero in the songs. And so uh, Melissa, who's our chief trainer at SpaceX, actually took the time while we were in quarantine to like mixed together like a, a 2021 version of a mixtape um, so that we could oh just I play it, it on on, uh, on the iPod they had in there and time it so that exactly as we were pulling up, we were, you know. <laughs> Finished with the list? Yeah, exactly. So we had a mix of uh, uh, everything from Blue Light Orchestra to some Guns N' Roses. Uh, oh yeah. yeah, a little bit of, um, yes, yeah, some Hugh Jackson. It was a, it was a pretty good mix. Um, and uh, actually Tom and I, and I think Kayla and Matthias, you know, in the travel back and forth to SpaceX and back and forth to different training locations. That's how we sort of sussed out what's on that playlist. I'm sure they did the same for tonight. In with a great finish of the song. As we just saw there, we have, of course, permission to go through those stoplights uh, <laughs> with the full <laughs> security <laughs> escort. And hey, folks, listen, Raja has some great insight into space flight, what it takes to be an astronaut, how he got there. If you want to ask some questions, we want to invite you to participate. If you'd like to ask him a question over the next three hours, jump on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, or Twitch, and send your question with the hashtag AskNASA. We look forward to hearing from you, and I know Raja really enjoyed answering the questions the other night, and he'll do it again. Let's introduce you now to today's crew, Captain Stephen Bowen. He hails from Cohasset, Massachusetts, and is married with three children. He holds the title of first U.S. Navy submarine officer to be selected as a mission specialist by NASA. Captain Bowen is also a veteran of NASA's space flights, including space shuttle flights on the STS-126, 120, 132 rather, and 133. During those missions, he and his crew expanded the living quarters on the ISS, delivered an integrated cargo carrier, and a Russian mini research module. He has logged more than 40 days in space, including 47 hours and 18 minutes in seven spacewalks. He's the wily old veteran, and today he's the commander of Crew 6, a position you know well. I do, yeah, and it's a, it's a great position for him to be in. Uh, like you mentioned, he's got some serious experience in street cred, and much like Tom Marshburn on my flight, trusted to, to mentor uh, and lead three rookies going up there. Um, and so I know he's well up to the task and enjoying, enjoying going on this trip. Sitting next to Stephen is pilot Warren Woody Hoberg. The 37-year-old is from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He studied aeronautics and astronautics from MIT before getting a doctorate in electrical engineering and computer science from the University of California, Berkeley. During grad school, Hoberg worked as an EMT with the Yosemite Search and Rescue. Crew 6 will be Hoberg's first flight since NASA selected him to be an astronaut in 2017. He is also a commercial pilot with instrument, single engine, and multi-engine ratings. As pilot for Crew 6, he will be responsible for spacecraft syst systems and performance. Aboard the station, he will serve as an Expedition 68 and 69 flight engineer. And his uh, most important role is to continue the presence of turtles on the space station. <laughs> so what he uh, c also commonly referred to as the smartest turtle, but also the most humble one. You wouldn't know that talking to him at any of the Core things on his countdown, advanced team is bio you for crew arrival. You just heard the core call for uh, countdown uh, time for the crew arrival. But yeah, all those things what he's done uh, by themselves would be amazing, let alone in combination. In the role of mission specialist is astronaut Sultan al Niyadi. He was chosen by the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center of the United Arab Emirates to be part of Expedition 6869. The father of five spent most of his life in Al Ain and Abu Dhabi, but in 2020 traded that in for astronaut training in Houston at NASA's Johnson Space Center. This will be 
his first trip to space. You're familiar with flying with a bunch of rookies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, can't understate how important this is. The first UOE astronaut going up on a U.S. commercial vehicle to the U.S. segment of the station. This is uh, amazing. Uh, the fruit, you know, coming to fruition of a long partnership uh, and a lot of work to get us here. We saw a shot of the vehicle assembly building dead ahead, and uh, they'll get up, make that right-hand turn, and go right by it. Talking about the mission specialists, it's also the first trip to space for the second mission specialist, Roscosmos cosmonaut Andrei Fedyev. Andrei was selected as a cosmonaut back in 2012. He will be working to monitor the spacecraft during the dynamic launch and re-entry phases of flight. And once on board station, he will be a flight engineer for Expeditions 68 and 69. Yeah, and great to have Andre on board. I flew out here and back with uh, Christina Cook for the first launch attempt, and she knows him and just says, just an amazingly big heart, and it's going to be a joy to work with on the space station. Missed getting into space on his 42nd birthday the other day, <laughs> but I'm sure he'll take a belated birthday present in the form of a launch tonight. I'm sure they had some extra cake back at crew quarters for him afterwards. <laughs> So we also got to break in. We mentioned last time it's the first time they're using the black Teslas versus the white Teslas. So not sure if maybe Crew 6 may or maybe have zapped the windshields an extra time to, to count, <laughs> count for their <laughs> second trip out there. So there's yeah. definitely some room to be filled on these windshields and uh, maybe hide some stickers in a few places where they find after the fact. Yeah, those stickers will uh, you know get to go on those Teslas for the first time since SpaceX uh, told us they're expanding their fleet of ride out vehicles. We know they're getting close because I can hear the helicopter. There it is, passing overhead as they pass in front of the Kennedy Space Center uh, VAB and just a few feet away from the Turn Basin. And while we're looking at the VAB, the home of the Artemis One mission and all Artemis missions, it's a good time to talk about what happened at the Turn Basin the other day. They're getting ready to pass by that body of water as we see some folks waving at those cars as they go by. Several weeks ago, NASA's recovery team was in the water, training to return NASA astronauts after a flight back from the moon. So as they get ready to pass this part of the Kennedy Space Center, let's get an update about what happened out there in our Moon Minute. Right now, NASA scientists and engineers are preparing for Artemis II. The mission will send four astronauts on a trip around the moon in 2024. But before that happens, test crews are practicing how to recover astronauts from the Orion spacecraft after splashing down in the Pacific Ocean. This black full-scale replica capsule named Vader stands for Vehicle Advanced Demonstrator for Emergency Rescue. It spent the last couple of weeks in the Turn Basin here at the Kennedy Space Center where it was floated on the water and tested. Crews practiced opening the hatch and installing an inflatable porch, an important piece of equipment to make sure astronauts can be recovered safely. If needed, adjustments will be made and then it will be shipped to San Diego where NASA and the Navy can perform recovery tests in the Pacific Ocean. And for more Artemis updates, check out the QR code on your screen. We're going to pop it up right there. Just scan that with your uh, smartphone, and you'll get updates from our official blog, blogs.nasa.gov forward slash Artemis. We're always updating it with frequent updates as we gear up for Artemis 2. It's nice to see them out there already working on the next mission. Yeah, it's been a, a long prog long iteration and since uh, Artemis just Orion, just you know, as part of the Artemis just likes the dragon, lands in the water, a lot of training goes into making sure we're ready for that. We talked about the mission specialist, Raj, and how we've got the UAE, we've got Roscosmos. It's all a part of flying integrated crews. And for NASA, this ensures operational safety. Crew members on station are trained to do maintenance and spacewalks, and it also protects against contingencies, such as a problem with any crew spacecraft, serious crew medical issues, or an emergency aboard the station that requires a crew and the vehicle that they are assigned to to return to Earth sooner than planned.
We had an issue with a spacecraft on station, a backup spacecraft. The Soyuz was flown up there. But in the interim, NASA always has a backup plan. And so the astronaut that flew up on the Soyuz um, had a ride to go home if it was needed. That's right, yeah. So we're always, uh, we always talk about the next worst failure when we're looking as kind of the, the mindset we have at uh, Johnson Space Center uh, and in the astronaut corps. And so, yeah, exactly, you know, always thinking about what could go wrong and having a plan to deal with that. And that's exactly the case we're in. Uh, now have another Soyuz up there, and so now back to what I would call more nominal ops. As the caravan passes the security gate at uh, the Launch Complex 39, Let's check in now for the first time with Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, and that's where we find Courtney Beasley with an update from Mission Control. Good evening, Courtney. Good evening. Thanks, Daryl, and welcome to the International Space Station Flight Control Room at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Mission Control is essentially the nerve center for operating the International Space Station, working in tandem with our partner agencies and providers around the globe. Together, we've ensured the station is ready to welcome Crew 6. Leading the team inside the room right now is Flight Director Judd Freeling. He will also lead the joint NASA SpaceX Go No Go polls once we're in integrated operations with Mission Control here in Houston and at SpaceX in Hawthorne, working together to bring Crew Dragon to its new home in space. Meanwhile, the crew aboard the space station is currently in a sleep period set to wake up around midnight central time. When we check back in later, we'll talk a little more about what the crew on the International Space Station has been doing to prepare for Crew 6. But for now, we'll send it back to the team over at Kennedy. Daryl. All right, thank you very much, Courtney. And Mission Control ready to go back here at America's Spaceport. We're yep. watching the Teslas with four or well three astronauts and one cosmonaut going through the security gate at Launch Complex 39A. So this is inside the pad perimeter. It's inside the blast danger area. Yep, and you see him going by what's called the horiz horizontal integration facility. So you saw him drive by the VAB, which is the vertical assembly building we use for Artemis. Uh, SpaceX actually integrates their vehicle horizontally, uh, and then that rolls out. You see those railroad tracks there. That's how it goes out on the the, the transport erector launcher there, that the tell. Uh, so they actually stack the capsule and the trunk inside that vehicle and roll it up the tracks there, and then the tail lifts it up into position on the pad. And a cool view there from the, the lead Tesla with that out the window view uh, as they're coming up. Yeah, to love that as we're looking at the base of the rocket. And, you know, recapping again the issue from Sunday night, there was uh, a problem with uh, actually a, a clogged drain line for the TTEB system. This is the um, engine ignition fluid that fills the bottom there, the base of the rocket, to make sure that each, each of the engines of the Falcon 9 lights up. They found out about it and uh, didn't have the confidence that they would have enough engine ignition fluid to light those engines, so they scrubbed. Rajley later found out that there was a clogged filter in one of the engine lines, and so they changed the filter. They blew out the lines with uh, gaseous nitrogen, cleaned them all out, and now it's up and running great. Yeah, so it's great news. So yeah, the T-Tab in super simple terms is kind of like the spark plug of an engine. So we'll mm -hmm. talk later tonight as they're loading prop. You know, there's fuel and oxidizer that feeds the engines, but that initial spark comes from the T-Tab that, you know, sort of like lighting a gas grill and you know, reaching in there with that wand and clicking it on. So that's basically what was, was going on. Uh, whenever you see signals like that, initially it's like, well, is it actually a problem or is it just bad telemetry? Um, and that's why, you know, they talk about it through mission control, try to look for alternate sensor readings, but ultimately the safe and that has proved out the right thing to do is to, to call the launch um, and, and do what's absolutely safest for the crew. We talked a lot, launch, launch time. Down, crew have arrived at the pad. You just heard the core call uh, to the team that the crew's uh, on the pad, and that word goes out to the closeout crew and the folks who are setting up displays uh, who don't aren't watching the 4K stream know what's going on. <laughs> um, That's right. But uh, yeah, so that's they would know if they, they were watching. <laughs> they, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hopefully they're not watching. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but uh, yeah, so the T-Tab, again, uh, if there's ever a doubt, you know, we do have protocols for like, is it a bad telemetry or just one bad sensor? But in this case, there's a few indications that there was something wrong. Um, and uh, they made the, the right call to stand down and, as you said, found an actual clog and fixed that. And so the good news is we're, we're back on track. That's a great point about the telemetry. 
versus you know the problem it can look one way and you could find out there's a problem with the sensor like you mentioned yep. but in this case it literally was an issue that they were able to identify and then uh, quickly correct and so we're excited to light them up tonight crew six and nasa and spacex this is our sixth crew rotation to the international space station since 2020 this successful nasa program is called commercial crew and it's based right here at the kennedy space center jasmine hopkins now joins us live with one of the leaders of this program program jasmine thank you so much daryl uh, we are back tonight on the balcony of the operations support building number two here at kennedy space center and right now we're so glad mm -hmm. to be joined by kathy leaders the associate administrator for nasa's space operations mission directorate good evening kathy good evening so we Happy to be here. <laughs> of course, and we are happy to have you. This is round two, as we yes. said earlier, you know, a second time's a charm. But really, let's talk about that seriously, that we prioritize safety here at NASA. We only launch when we're ready, right? Yes, and you know, there's a, it, it kind of seems like a cliche because we say it over and over, you know, space flight's hard. We say it's really, really hard. And, but when you look at all the things that have to be done perfectly to make sure we're flying safely, it is hard and and it's that attention to detail that makes us ensure that we're flying our crew safely and so you just got to step through it carefully you know and i tell the team one step at a time and you know sometimes you can be almost at that you know that five yard line seeing the goal in sight like we were you know early monday morning um and you can have a clogged filter and you just got to stop and say okay we're not ready to go fly today and we're gonna stop take our time get ready to go and reset up again and um, but it it is really I'm very proud of the team because the way they worked through that problem and the way they said hey we aren't ready right now to be able to say we're safe and so we're gonna stop and make sure we've got this all figured out and then come back and fly again I think it is a real testimony to the team it really is, Kathy. And as you said, space flight is hard, but we have been just pushing forward with the commercial crew program. As mm -hmm. Daryl said earlier, this is the sixth crew rotation flight from NASA and SpaceX to the space station. What do you think of that cadence from the commercial crew program? Well, you know, this is near and dear to my heart. And so obviously, you know, as the ex commercial crew program manager, I'm awfully, I'm awfully proud of the way the team has, you know, and not only the sixth crew rotation mission, but you know, really the seventh mission with also doing demo two. You know, in March of 2020, as we were kind of in our campaign getting ready for the demo flight, um, I would have dreamed, <laughs> this would have been like the, the greatest dream for me that we would be here, you know, three years later, less than three years later, and have maintained this cadence of safely being able to rotate our crews. So extremely proud of the team. Yeah, and it really does seem like almost surreal that we've come this far. And of course, we're working clo very closely with SpaceX on this mission, but we're adding more partners to this. What are we doing for the commercialization of low Earth orbit? Well, this next, you know, four or five months is just going to be incredible for the International Space Station. I mean, it's a really busy port <laughs> for a lot of vehicles coming up. So obviously we've got, you know, Crew 6 coming up, but then we've got another SpaceX cargo mission also coming up in the March time frame, and that's paving the way for our Boeing uh, first crewed flight test vehicle that will be coming up in end of April. And then we have Axiom 2, our second private astronaut mission. And following that, two more cargo vehicles in the next four or five months. So. There's no rest for the wicked, and these people must be very wicked because <laughs> they're not getting a break or not much of a break in here. But honestly, this is this is what we dreamed that the space station program would be doing at this stage. You know, we dreamed that we'd be having cargo vehicles and crew vehicles because this is when we get to maximize the use and the science that's created on the International Space Station. Right, we really are living the dream. It's a dream to be at NASA at this time. And we've been at this for a very long time, actually. The space station is going into its uh, 22nd year. What do you think of uh, America's continuous presence on the space station? Well, we always talk about not only staying on the space station, but not giving up our presence in low Earth orbit. And so, you know, not only are we preparing for the next eight to 10 years with the space station, 
but we're also preparing for our continued presence in low Earth orbit with our commercial LEO destinations. And so we have a lot of work that we have planned to do on the space station, but we also have a lot of work that we need to continue to do on our commercial LEO destinations to get us ready to buy down the human risks that we have for our exploration missions. There's really no other place except for LEO to really be buying down those crew risks and, and we need to have those risks bought down for us to really be able to do another long duration flight like a mission to Mars will be. Exactly, and we're just looking forward to the moon, forward on to Mars. Kathy, thank you so much for being here tonight. Oh, thank you. Of course, Daryl, back to you. Thank you, Jasmine, and great words from Kathy Leaders there. If you're just joining us, well, you're watching live coverage of NASA's and SpaceX's mission known as Crew-6. Good evening and welcome to Kennedy Space Center in Florida. I'm Daryl Nail, along with a recent flyer on a SpaceX Dragon, and that is Crew-3 Commander Raja Chari. Thanks Appreciate to you being yeah, here. Thanks, Daryl. Happy to be back and to get another chance uh, to hopefully get the Crew-6 off the ground. Um, we're getting to see uh, right now that them showing up uh, to take a look at the look at the rocket. We talked about last time. The reason they have to the crane back like that is the way that the suit constrains you, and it's it's meant it's built to be pressurized. But when it's not pressurized, and it kind of pushes down on your head and neck just a little bit. So, taking uh, one more look at the rocket before they they head into the elevator. And I did hear from Woody that uh, they did in fact change the labels on the button pad inside that. So uh, it does actually say space on the top button and Earth on the bottom button. <laughs> the elevator buttons inside. Yes, if uh, folks you haven't seen that meme floating around, there's a picture that shows all the buttons inside this elevator and they're marked out by the foot level. The top used to be the 255 foot level, but apparently it now says yeah, space. Yeah, it's been modified to say space, which <laughs> is appropriate. Uh, this, this, the 39 uh, complex is historic. We've been using it since the early days of the space age and you know, continuing to upgrade uh, even the labels. How cool was that to reach over and press space? <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, that's been awesome, awesome to be able to hit the destination that you're going to. Yeah. Uh, this is the view at the top of the elevator, so they pop out here and then they walk up a floor. Uh, you can see there's the graded floors, or for if in the event of an emergency egress, they douse this whole thing with a whole bunch of water so you don't have to get slippery. So that's why they're f graded floors, so the water can actually flow through. And uh, you see astronaut Nick Haig is with them. He's number 12. See yeah. him turning the corner there? This is the astronaut support person. And uh, Nick Haig, of course, an experienced astronaut, been up to space station, uh, been through in a launch abort himself. Great resource to the astronauts. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, Reed Wiseman, who's the, the former chief of the office, likes to say that Nick is a unicorn. He's pretty much the only hmm. person uh, you know, right now that's, you know, well, he's been to space twice, even though he only won one min one mission. is the first time they aborted, they actually ballistically went into that's orbit. Right. So that's he right. counts that as two, rightfully so. <laughs> okay. uh, but yeah, that's really, really unusual. There's, I don't think there's anyone else in the office that's been through a launch abort, um, which as we know, the commercial crew program has that as a requirement. So we've got that system now with both Dragon and Starliner. But to actually have done that is a, a way, <laughs> Pretty extreme. Yeah. See Sultan and Andre heading up the elevator. Uh, you notice tonight everything's going faster, which is a testament to the fact that we practiced this once. Um, so they're, you know, now this is the second time the team's doing this. Uh, and you know, Woody himself commented there's almost like a free sim that they got to do the other day. Things are going a lot faster. Certainly noticed that. Just to fill finish the thought on the uh, launch abort that was a Soyuz in 2018 um, that launched out of Kazakhstan. waiting for the mission specialist and here they come. So they'll head up the stairs as well. You saw Woody and Steve were just starting to make their phone calls. We talked uh, the last time that one of the other jobs. So Nick Haig as the astronaut support person, one of the things they're doing is uh, like items like glasses, watches, things like that that have to be carried that they don't have room for in their pockets. He's kind of handling that uh, logistics. He's also uh, the one who dials the numbers, which is not a trivial task, calling on a government phone to the UAE <laughs> or to Russia. I can um, attest to so that. So you got to figure out, yeah, the country codes, that do I have dial plus nine or plus nine plus one? But uh, yeah. <laughs> it's different which on which every number phone. Gets yeah, you exactly. Out, which number gets so you, you the definitely international. you want to yeah. make sure you've done that. And you want to make sure the person who's going to get the call knows that it's not a spam call. So you need to make sure you give them that number in advance. Uh, the Chevron's on the ground there. They're going to be... Uh, when they go onto the spacecraft, they're walking against the chevrons, but those chevrons are meant for, in a low visibility, 
uh, egress, as I make a mention, the water system is on, so you would be getting doused with water, so you can look down, and that's pointing you to the egress baskets, which on the far left side of the screen, it just kind of went out of view, but you can see where these slide wires are at, um, and that's how you would get down to the ground. Now you can just see them on the left side. Yeah. They're like a super fun zip line ride uh, that you would get into a basket and then go down uh, to the bottom of the pad. And there's a loudspeaker system up there. Um, and so as you're egressing, the launch director would be giving you instructions, most key, like how many people are still on the pad. Because as the crew, if it's just four of you, that's relatively easy. But if the closeout crew is there, you're, you gotta make sure you count baskets and people to make sure everyone gets down to the ground. Want to have a full head count exactly. of everybody who's out there? Exactly, you don't want to leave anyone up there. Yep. Right. So it looks like they're cycling through the phone calls now. This is the view looking towards the crew access arm. It is behind the black door. So when they wrap up their call there, they'll be headed through the door and we'll get ready to see our first two astronauts make their way from the launch tower across the crew access arm and begin to ingress to the Dragon spacecraft. And, and besides the fact they've done this twice, the other reason things go a little quicker is all the little traditions are kind of already done. So they've already signed the patch in crew quarters. They'll have already signed the meatball here. Uh, so some of those things that take a little bit of time that are, that are baked into the, uh, the timeline uh, don't have to be redone. So you can see Woody and Steve just starting to head out on the crew access arm now. And there they are coming through the crew access arm. The commander and pilot, Stephen and Woody, making their way inside Dragon. Big thumbs up and a wave from the crew. They're hoping today is the day. Core on countdown, crew are in the white room. You see uh, Arthur is the core at SpaceX, so they keep the shifts the same. So. Um, Again, we kind of talked a little bit about last time, but the importance of all the sims leading up to this are the same voices. So they, you know, through the slip and through the scrub, retiming all the shifts at SpaceX and at Houston actually all stayed on the same timeline, so they could be all the same people. That's Arthur Berrialt, the crew operations resource engineer with SpaceX. That's his voice coming over. You can see the ninjas helping get their. Uh, those are the shoe protects with the boot guards coming off. Yep. So it protects for two things, FOD, FOD in the capsule is one thing, but the other thing is there's slots in the bottom of those heels, and that's what actually, when you see them get in, you'll see them put their foot up and then down, almost like putting on a, like a ski boot type thing, where ah. it locks in, and that's what keeps your feet restrained under the launch loads and re-entry loads, um, which is why you'll also see them sometimes, if not during uh, before they are on the launch escape system, you'll see them lock them in, um, but that also protects the channel from any nicks uh, or dings on the bottom side of that. All right, we've got a question uh, that's coming in from social media as the astronauts Captain, crawl in. Started. Arthur calling the ingress has started. Which we can see on our screen. So here's the question. Space Brandon on Twitter asks, he's referencing to the view out the window. What is it like to take in this view? Loud and clear, seat two, how me? And C2 has you loud and clear as well. So I'll tell you, it's uh, it's awesome. The the view f out the Dragon window, you don't really see getting in because you're as you saw as they crawl in, their head is towards the seats, and then when they f we flip around, you can see that the white room and that crew access arm kind of blocks the view out the two windows there, which you can see uh, if you look at Ninja 10 to their right and left, you can see the Dragon windows. The view you do have is before you walk across the crew access arm, and it's per SpaceX Dragon seat three, come check. Wait for Arthur. Loud right. and clear, seat three, how me? Good evening, Arthur. I have you the same. Yeah, so the view from where. Good evening, Woody and Steve. Good to hear from you. Sultan and Andre are standing is awesome. You got the water, especially on a clear night. Um, you do this during dry dress. You come up here and take in the view, but seeing. Yeah, I think he's talking about taking in the yeah. view right there. So right? you can go to the corner uh, to the where that kind of white post is, kind of where Ninja 14 is at, and you can kind of hang off the edge. Don't, don't do it too far. <laughs> but. <laughs> um, but yeah, it is, it is pretty amazing. And the seeing the clouds and the water, I think, is what's most distinctly different. Uh, so on Earth, you can see the actual individual waves and the clouds moving in from space. Uh, you definitely can't see that level of detail. Um, so yeah, trying to take all that in, I don't think you really appreciate it until you come back and see that same thing. And we can see Nick Haig now taking uh, 
cell phone shots of Sultan as he's on the phone, which a good fellow astronaut does. And you heard uh, Woody and Steve checking in with Arthur. Those are just the initial comm checks. Uh, we'll do much more intensive ones later, but that's just to make sure that when they connect their umbilical that it's fully seated. And so if you get a good comm check, you know that the little pins that uh, connect that loop are good. Our so mission specialist now getting ready to board Dragon, Sultan and Andre with a big thumbs up. Beautiful shot from high above looking into the crew access arm as they make their way aboard Dragon. And while we're watching the mission specialists in action, let's take another social question, which is relevant. <laughs> and and we were just showing off, showing, yep. you know, getting the Grab space techs as yep, a badge. We, yeah, so, it is, so they, we talked about last time they grabbed the, the, the ninja's name tags to, to take with them, uh, and they distribute those amongst the crew so they can fit them in their pockets and, and satchels. And the question there looks like, What's the mobility like on the pressure suit while walking around? It's actually fine. It's just a little, uh, a little bit of pressure on the top of your head pulling down. Um, and as you saw, that's kind of why they arch their back to look up. You can't tilt your neck backwards. And obviously, if you turn your head side to side, your head is kind of turning inside the, the helmet as opposed to the entire helmet moving. Um, so it's just more a matter of not straining your neck. It's like traction almost. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. just a mild traction. Yeah, and, and it can get hot, so you don't do a whole lot of action uh, unless you have cooling attached to you, especially with the, the weather here. Um, but compared, and again, this is a, in what's called an IV, in-vehicle suit, IVA suit, not a EV or extravehicular suit. So way different than if you were trying to walk around in an EMU, which is what we use for spacewalks, that would be a way different story, and you, you probably would not be able to walk uh, in on Earth gravity is it weighs upward of three, four hundred pounds, uh, whereas this one is is meant to be able to move around. Um, when it is inflated, it's meant to be in the seat. So if, if it was pressurized, it's not meant to be moving around in the cabin with it because you can't, you don't really have uh, joint mobility. So it's meant to be restrained by the straps and in the seats to to be fully functional in a depressed scenario. There go our two mission specialists with the duck as they cross the hatch, being very careful not to touch or hit the edges of that hatch because that seal is so very important to maintaining a good seal when they pressurize the cabin in space. And now our cameraman will go inside or wait. <laughs> So those are the those are the crew satchels. You saw those uh, white bags. Woody and Steve's are already on their leg. There's a little loop under there uh, that the ground techs help connect for them. You see uh, Sultan and Andre hooking in their umbilicals. So expect shortly they'll do their comm checks with Arthur and the core. And it's worth noting for those who follow very closely that SpaceX is now doing some of their checks and operations in parallel rather than sequentially. It could end up sequentially, but they're aiming for parallel, and that will reduce the total time of the operation starting right now by about 27 minutes. Core, this is MS2, C4. Uh, how do you read me? Com check. Doing com checks even as they're getting seated. Loud and clear from seat four. How me? Loud and clear, C4. Ankara, uh, MS-1, uh, com check. And loud and clear, MS-1 from seat one. How me? I got it loud and clear. And a great view of Andre's uh, buckle there. So, so it's a five-point harness. Um, the crew can totally do it on their own, but just to save wear and tear on the suits, a lot of times the ground crew will, will help with doing that. Um, and that way it makes sure it's really cinched down. So the way each on that circular harness around his waist, each of the waist straps and then the leg and the shoulders connect into a slot and then to get out you rotate it counterclockwise or clockwise and all five pop out. Similar to a harness in a jet? Right, it's actually very similar to like an F-35 harness, yep. Same kind of design. And Raj, of course, you flew the F-35 and the F-16 F and the uh, F-16. No, don't, no, not no F-16. Oh, no, okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> F-15 F and F-14? Uh, F-15E and then F-35. Yeah. F-35, okay. Don't worry, I s it's okay for people who fly the F-16. I still, it's, it's not their fault. <laughs> <laughs> well, the F-35, certainly the tip of the spear when it comes to the 
Air Force, and uh, you were involved in that program for a while. I was, yep. I think the only job I would have left that job for was this job. So. <laughs> and we're glad you're here. Had an incredibly successful Crew 3 mission you were the commander of, and you had some great uh, astronauts along with you. Yeah, so flew with uh, yeah, Tom Marshburn uh, was our, our pilot. He had been on that he had been on a shuttle on a Soyuz, so just a great asset to have some some wide breadth. Kayla Barron, a classmate of mine, uh, also fellow a submariner, turtle. yeah, fellow uh -huh. turtle, fe uh, submariner. Um, yes. And so following in, in Steve's footsteps, and uh, and then Matthias Maurer uh, from ESA, the German astronaut, his first space flight as well, uh, and just awesome to get to work with all of them. It was, uh, yeah, it was the time of our life up there, honestly. And for those who wonder about what you mean when you talk about the turtles. It's the class of turtles, right? When you graduated uh, into being an astronaut. Right, so a, ba a bale of turtles is the technical term. A bale, <laughs> a bale of turtles. A, a okay. herd of turtles, if you will. Yeah, so the, the tradition in the astronaut office is the previous class names the incoming class. So we were named the turtles by the 2013 class um, somewhat as a, uh, a derogatory yes, term? it was. Yeah. I think slightly derogatory. <laughs> it meant to be slow, but uh, we took it as quite the compliment. So when the the vice president announced our class in 2017, he made the analogy that when he grew up, if you saw a, a turtle on a fence post, you knew s it didn't get there by itself. So we take it as a, a definite nod to all the people that got us here. Because um, the reality is, whether it's family, friends, the trainers at the different centers, uh, we are just the doers, the eyes and the ears for the mission control, the flight controllers, the scientists, uh, and our families to, to do the work. Um, so yeah, we definitely did not get here by ourselves. And so we, we love the, tur the turtle term and proud to be sending Woody up there to continue the, uh, Kathy mentioned a continuous US presence in space. Since for 22 years, we've had a continuous turtle presence in space since 2021. So <laughs> <laughs> Which is of course worth mentioning. <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, the most, the more important stat. <laughs> and I had also heard that, you know, poignantly, um, Turtles was fitting because when you uh, graduated, it was uh, Hurricane Harvey. That's that, right. Uh, yeah, when we showed up, put actually. a lot yep. of water down <laughs> in the Houston <laughs> yes. area. That was also a, a big part of it, yep. You can see they're doing zipper checks right now. Um, so there's a, each of the, l there's three main zippers, one that goes from one leg to the other, and then one on each arm. Uh, and on each of those, there's an inner bladder layer, which is the actual pressure garment, and then the outer layer is the restraint layer. And then down on the boots, they actually have a boot zipper on top of that. Um, but in each case, on the three main zippers, there's a white tooth that they're looking for, and you get a two-person check. So the person that does it looks for it, and then someone else visually verifies that white tooth is visible, that which guarantees that the pressure, uh, the pressure garment is sealed. Get that good seal, critical safety component for these suits. Got another social question, Raja, and this one is about one of your fellow astronauts. At Ian Benekin asks, do you miss your German space brother, Astro Matthias, and did he teach you something in German during your six months in space? Oh yeah, we, we definitely miss Matthias. Uh, one of the weird things when you come back is so uh, we s you spend you know your work day together and your downtime together for six months, and then when we came back, uh, you take a, a Gulf Stream back um, to JSC or to Ellington, and then JSC, and then he gets whisked away. So after seeing him for six months, all of a sudden he's gone. Uh, so it, is, it was almost like uh, having someone in your family ripped out of the house. A very uh, yeah, we definitely miss Matthias, and it's good whenever he gets back to visit us. In terms of learning German, uh, I think there's, I think he had his birthday up there, so we definitely learned that. And honestly, I forgot. Happy it. birthday in German. <laughs> honestly, I forgot that um, I'm supposed to know how to speak Russian as well, because we learned that as part of our training. And I, yeah, it's. <laughs> <laughs> you were working on I the Russian playlist. I you did I give it a good I, was, I was able to read the, the the songs that Andre had on his list. So I I have a little bit, but my German has escaped me. Oh well. It's but understandable. I'm sure Matthias would be. If you don't use it, it exactly, tends to yeah. Slip Matthias away, would yeah. be disappointed, but it tends to slip away, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 right, yeah, I got yeah. yeah. So again, way ahead of schedule here. So normally on the the timeline, the crew is using, but but 2:35 prior launch would be crew ingress, and you can see they're already much pretty, pretty much there already. Uh, so kind of doing some more checks here. So they're basically having the crew make sure that. So you can see those white loops on their straps they're meant so that the crew can find those and pull them tight so that gives them leverage to p pull down and tighten the restraints and so there's four of them two for their shoulders and you can see like what do you can see a little bit of better example down underneath his hands you can see there's kind of a grouping of four of them so two for his shoulders two for the legs and there's also toe loops 
which you can kind of see on Steve's. You can see him up near like where the uh, like the top of his foot, and that and those. We talked about sliding your foot into that restraint, mm -hmm. and then the loop goes over that that you then tighten with those straps. So that's basically what they're doing now is checking each one of those four on all four crew uh, and making sure that they're not too tight, especially for their feet, um, and completely restrained on their shoulders. That was a great shot we just saw by the SpaceX camera team that uh, showed one of their closeout crew members exiting the spacecraft. You got to feel as he went through it just how tight that space is. We've been following the launch teams as they continue working through the countdown. Currently, no issues are in work at the moment. Earlier this evening, around 7 p.m. Eastern time, there was a hydraulic leak detected out at the pad, but it was a minor one, one they were able to get uh, repaired pretty quickly and uh, didn't disturb the count. As we see our crew waving goodbye before uh, the SpaceX cameraman exits the capsule. You see over Woody's right shoulder the uh, three previous stickers of the crews that have flown in Endeavour. So once they get on orbit, I'm sure they've got a sticker in one of their pockets to, to add to that, that bulkhead back there. It's a great uh, observation there, Raja, because this is the Space fourth Dragon, flight. Dragon, the crew is ready for Tom Jones. The fourth flight for the Dragon Endeavour. SpaceX copies, stand by for umbilical comm check. The first three were de Demo 2, Crew 2, and Axiom 1, which was up at station when you were there. They were, which the first uh, private mission to the U.S. segment. Uh, first time we've launched private astronauts from the U.S., so yeah, a pretty historic mission. And, and just the start of things to come, you heard Kathy Leaders mention Axiom 2 will be launching in the near future. So we're definitely m uh, take incorporating lessons learned and, and moving forward. Yeah, what was that like? Y you've got you know your NASA job to do up in space, and then you're also helping private astronauts. Yeah, we enjoyed it. I think the the key, w the key is partnering on the science. So they bring, uh, I think the interesting thing is you've got uh, private, I'll commander, pilot, I'll MS-1, stand by MS-2, while they do their uh, com checks. Uh, commander has you loud and clear. Commander loud and clear. Pilot has you loud and clear. Pilot loud and clear. And the MS-1 got you loud and clear. MS-1 loud and clear. And MS-2 got loud and clear. MS-2 loud and clear. Umbilical comm checks are complete. Report when ready for seat rotation. As we get ready for the seat rotation, watching all four articulate upwards so they can get into launch position. Want to make a correction. It's a uh, camera woman with SpaceX who's getting those fabulous shots, relying on her to give us SpaceX Dragon. The crew is ready for seat rotation. These great views that we see, and this view right here. In fact, she's shooting it right now. SpaceX copies initiating seat rotation. sure it's a challenge to not only maintain that steady shot in that very small hatch, but she <laughs> also has to maneuver around the team, making right, sure yep. that she doesn't interfere with the operation. She's doing a great job. Exactly. Yeah, so there you can see the seats moving. So they're in uh, procedure 4.100 on the display, so that's what Woody was interacting with there a second ago. That comm check they did before was just checking the hard line communication, so their umbilicals through the spacecraft, through the umbilical to the ground. Uh, then they are now in 4.100 for seat rotation. So you saw them talking before Steve said they're ready. That was just making sure they verified visually that all their arms and everything was clear of the translation path of the seats. You don't want anything getting pinched. And then what they're watching now on the displays is what's called the tack count, which is the motor that's running the seats to see if anything uh, is out of limits. Looks like it was a good rotation, and they'll probably report that here shortly from the core. And you can Does see. Does it make a cool motor high tech You can sound actually like hear it. No? You know, you can. You it's more like, me, like uh. Dragon SpaceX seats are in the launch position. SpaceX Dragon copies and sinkers. Now you can see a great view underneath their seats of what else they're taking up to the space station with them. So those central ones there, those are cold lockers. So definitely some kind of science in there uh, that 
that has to be preserved at a particular temperature. The left side, uh, the aft two, look like it's some kind of cargo. The forward two, which we can't quite see as survival equipment, that'd be the red. And then the right side looks like a, uh, like a semi-larger piece of cargo. We call all those things CTBs, uh, those containers, um, and they are referred to by the Dragon size. SpaceX, you are go for section two, suit leak check preparation. SpaceX Dragon copies go for section two, suit leak check preparation. So that bag is red for a reason. Right, so it'd be easy to spot, here. exactly. I'll so be able uh, to spot that real quick. The timeline, so they have two displays, up, well, three displays, but the two they're probably looking at uh, is one's called a, a timeline or event details, we call it. Um, normally, you'd start, be ready for suit leak checks about 2.14 from launch, so again, running ahead, which is good. Uh, you heard Arthur ask him, or the Corps ask him to get ready for the suit leak check, so you saw him just pull their visors down. Uh, Steve's talking to him right now about the reminder to remain still. Um, there is a way for the crew to stop a leak check, uh, and the reason you would do that, because as it's pressurizing, let's say you've got a hot spot in the suit, that pressure bladder, for you know, there's folds in that, so as it inflates, it could poke into the back of your knee, elbow, or joint, and so there is the ability for the, the crew to stop that uh, to if someone's experiencing pain. Come in there and make the adjustment. Exactly, yep. And so they'll leave the door open for right. that reason? Yep. Yeah, and also if, they're, if the suit fails the leak check, they've got some components mm -hmm. up in the white room there where they could come and try to fix something. But the reason they did... The uh, SpaceX Dragon's hair is complete. We are ready for leak checks. SpaceX copies. You are go for Section 3 suit leak check. And we are go for Section 3 suit leak check. That's in work. So the whole reason they do the leak checks in the suit room is to find any gross malfunction uh, and know that the suit is fine. So if there were something between the suit room and now, you would suspect it was probably a zipper just not being fully sealed versus something actually wrong with the suit. So right and now, now we're seeing those suits inflate. Uh, not quite yet. Not so quite we'll yet. see them. Yeah, the way you'll know is you'll see their arms kind of go out like zombies eventually, which they're just kind of they're stretching out right now. Um, they're looking at uh, what's called a suit transducer. So they have they're wanting to make sure it's in zero. You'll hear Steve tell them that the tear is done. Yep, and now it looks like, it, based on where Andre's head is at in the helmet, it looks like it is inflating now. As you can see, hit the, you can see the, the neck ring kind of expanding, which is why on the ground uh, you see that helmet down on the top of their head, but now once it's inflating, you can see why the suit is built that way and restrained. As you can see now, you can just see his nose before you can see his mouth. So it pushes and the helmet up a little right, bit. Right, yep. And you can see Woody and uh, Andre's hands kind of, you can see their knees look way bigger now. And so they have an indication of what the suit pressure in each seat is at by, by individual, uh, and they're waiting to see if it holds steady at full pressure. And you can see at this point, the last basically 30 seconds are kind of critical. You try not to move. Is if you move, that can actually throw off the reading. And so at the same time that they're performing these suit leak checks, new for this mission, SpaceX is also right now performing the side hatch inspection. This is part of them doing those operations in parallel that I mentioned earlier, which will save them time and build time into the margin. Exactly. Just yeah. in case they need it. Yeah, it, wherever you can buy margin, uh, because this, these are all instantaneous launch windows, meaning uh, if there are problems, you know, unlike a shuttle launch where there's built-in holes, this one is a continuously running clock. Um, so anytime you can buy yourself margin for having problems, that, that's great. Our T0 tonight, 12.34 a.m. Eastern time. The range continues to report no issues, so we're looking good there. Also, Raja, the weather forecast continues to be acceptable. Take a look at this. Just like on Sunday, only a 5% chance of violation for weather. The only concern would be a flight through precipitation, which would come in the form of a cloud. Uh, SpaceX Dragon, four nominal suits. Well, there you had the four good suit leak checks. SpaceX copies and concurs. 
Closeout team will now perform final closeout steps and exit the capsule. Proceed to section four, side hatch close, and report when ready to close the hatch. Additionally, stand by for ground station comm checks. SpaceX tracking copies, we're in section four, side hatch closure. It's good to hear the good suits, and there yep. we see them Already well underway it. with that side hatch inspection. Yep, so I'd expect the crew will pop their visors back open here shortly. And then uh, the core mentions, you can see them opening now. And you can definitively see, uh, it's a good example there. Now you can see Andre, with the way his helmet sits when it's depressurized, you can see all the way down to his chin. So you can see how that the suit expands when it's uh, inflated. Want to wrap up the weather before we get too far away from it. Only a 5% chance of violation for launch from here. And SpaceX Dragon, crew was ready for side hatch push. So the crew's ready for the side hatch to be closed, but the closeout crew continues to inspect and document. SpaceX copies. The launch team still monitoring the weather in the ascent corridor. And I understand from our team at JSC that that's right on the line. We're green to go at the moment, but they are monitoring that closely. Of course, this is the winds and the sea states along the ascent corridor. Should, uh, for some reason, Dragon need to abort off the top of the Falcon 9, it would need to splash down somewhere along the eastern seaboard. And you gotta have good weather conditions because those astronauts will be landing in the ocean in the case of emergency, and they could be there for an hour or two before they are uh, rescued from the capsule, and you want to have good sea states for any kind of rescue to happen. Exactly, yeah, so that's the a key thing, and it can somewhat sometimes be frustrating if the weather is beautiful here, but uh, bad along the eastern seaboard. And it's not just unique to Dragon. Actually, when I was talking to Steve about this scrub, he so you mentioned uh, he flew on STS-126, and STS-127, uh, which is the following shuttle flight, he was the lead astronaut closeout crew, and they had six scrubs, and two of those were, the weather was beautiful here, um, but not along not along the ascent corridor. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, a very it's important for both the capsule and for the recovery teams as well. So if the, the winds and waves are out of limits, that can be a problem for the capsule landing in the water, specifically the, what's called the back shell or the bottom of the capsule. Um, and then the other problem is, yeah, actually getting a recovery team to them. Uh, if you've got really bad weather conditions, it's dangerous for them as well. Uh, so we try to protect, you need to protect for that entire case and that whole corridor. And we also protect for uh, some trajectory deviations, if you will. So, um, you know, Usually things are pretty much right down the middle, but we also build in uh, errors to that trajectory. So you actually have to build out a zone uh, along the ascent corridor. It's not just a straight line. Mm -hmm. And so that adds even more surface area. And when you're talking the ocean, there's a, a, <laughs> lot, of, a lot, lot of weather. Out there. There's a lot of ocean out there. Yeah, it, exactly. it is a large area of weather that you need to be good to go before you launch, which is much different than uncrewed launches. Right. When you're not launching people, you don't have to monitor the weather to the extent that you do on a night like tonight anytime you're launching astronauts. So uh, it, is a, it is a tighter uh, needle to thread. Yeah, it is an impressive array of recovery forces that are pre-positioned uh, to support this. And so there's Navy ships, there's Air Force assets, uh, pararescue personnel, Basically, not just along the East Coast, but on the West Coast, out of Hickam Air Force Base in Hawaii, there's C-17. So pretty much uh, it's a worldwide posture. Uh, other nations volunteer to help. So uh, when you when we you hear them talk about the, the abort calls on the way up, they'll call Shannon, which is actually in Ireland. Um, so we have help even from uh, European partners. Uh, so it is uh, quite the choreograph. Uh, effort to make sure that they're safe all along the ascent trajectory. Shannon's a good Irish name, right? <laughs> yeah. For, uh, well, yeah, so on uh, Crew 1, Shannon got to call Shannon. <laughs> <laughs> and there's the good ship Shannon as well. So you can see uh, they're taking a look at the hatch seals uh, on the hatch side. So they already looked at the spacecraft side while they're getting in. That's why you see Ninja 35 kind of holding in position and someone be tucked behind there. They're looking at the hatch side seals as part of the inspection before they close it up. And while they take a look at that, we want to talk a little bit about the beginning of this program and the history that was made, as well as quite the honor that was bestowed on Raja's fellow astronauts. We're launching, of course, American astronauts on uh, American rockets from American soil. And it all began with those two trailblazers of the commercial crew program, Bob and Doug, 
who recently received the highest civilian honor an astronaut can achieve. Dragon, SpaceX closeout team is taking final steps in prep for side hatch closure. Stand by for transition to pad hatch closed. And please ensure that all items are secure from now through launch. It is my great honor to award you both the Congressional Space Medal of Honor. In January, Vice President Kamala Harris spoke to a packed room at the White House about the dedication of NASA astronauts Doug Hurley and Bob Binken. Bob and Doug represent the best of our nation. There's no question about it. NASA selected both men to be astronauts for the space shuttle program in 2000. But when the shuttle program ended 11 years later, Doug and Bob's work did not. NASA collaborated with the private sector to build the next generation of spacecraft. Every part of the capsule, from flight controls and emergency procedures, to computer displays and cockpit layout, all of that shaped by Bob and Doug's decades of know-how. And in May of 2020, the SpaceX Crew Dragon was ready to soar. Bob and Doug returned to the Kennedy Space Center. They suited up, they waved to their families, and they rode an elevator up nearly 20 stories. They strapped in to their seats and waited as the tanks beneath them filled with tens of thousands of gallons of fuel. And then... Three, two, one, zero. Ignition. Lift off of the Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon. Go NASA, go SpaceX, Godspeed, Bob and Doug. Demo 2 was the first crewed flight for NASA's commercial crew program, ushering in a new era of human spaceflight. And now, the names Doug Hurley and Bob Binken have been added to an elite list. Prior to the ceremony, the Congressional Space Medal of Honor had only been given to 28 people, astronauts like Neil Armstrong and John Glenn. We're following in their footsteps, and you know, so it's just an incredible, incredible, incredible honor. It was humbling to be a part of the mission. You know, we got to be the smiling faces on the pointy end of a rocket ship. Because of their bravery, Missions like Crew 6 are happening today. Bob and Doug together have written the first page of a new chapter in the history of American space flight. Well, congratulations to both Bob and Doug and a well-deserved honor. Doug Hurley recently retiring uh, from the astronaut corps, Bob Binken, still cranking it along. In fact, he came out and was an astronaut co-host sitting in your seat, Raja, for Crew 5. And it's a, um, it's a great contribution. I like the sound bite where he said, you know, the smiling faces on the pointy end of a rocket ship. But they often, you know, gave a lot of credit to those around them who helped build, build the rocket, build the spacecraft, train them, get them to where they needed to be in order to have the confidence to ride a space vehicle for the very first time and make that historic flight. Yeah, they were re they were really leaders of the team. There's no doubt about that. And I, I can't repeat enough what the vice president said. Like, they, it literally is a new era of space flight. I mean, uh, you know, Kathy, leaders mentioned, like, here we are on crew six. Who would have thought that then? I mean, mm -hmm. um, and just the way they designed that team, there's still things in training. It's very common to hear, even as we talk about Starship design and stuff like that for Lunar Lander with SpaceX, but definitely during Dragon training flows of like, uh, w why is the display this way? Or how, you know, this seems like a great solution. How do, how do we come up with that? Like, oh, Bob and Doug. Mm -hmm. um, and they were uh, so inclusive on the in training as well. I distinctly remember getting to come out on some trips and, and Doug and Bob having me sit in the capsule with them and them taking the time, not only they're doing the sim, but also showing me like, you know, this is what this means and this is why this display is doing that. So, I mean, they brought every long one along with them. Um, and so I, yeah, it wasn't, they're being very humble <laughs> saying, yeah, they, they are riding the rocket, but they, they brought that team along and um, they spent many, many years before Demo 2 
developing the work, working with SpaceX, working with the NASA teams, I mean, over a decade of work to get to where they were, and so very well deserved and, and couldn't be prouder of them, and they have left a lasting mark on the astronaut office, on the agency, and really on the nation. I mean, we have now an entire industry that, that didn't exist, you know, mm -hmm. before this commercial crew program. I mean, it's, it's quite amazing when you look at uh, like going to SpaceX, going to Boeing, going to these places that are doing these programs and seeing all these engineers that have a place that they're proud to go to after college and want to go to, it's inspiring. Um, and yeah, it's, it is an exciting time coming down here to the Cape. You just see the buzz down here. There's so much going on and they kicked all this off. It, there is a launch now every six days here at America's Spaceport and you're, you're absolutely right, Raja. Uh, you know, it's a, We've <laughs> never been this busy. Yeah. Um, you know, aiming for more than 100 launches this year, just SpaceX alone. Um, so uh, an incredible amount of activity. I like from the story that you just told that they took the time with you, the commander for Crew 3, even though your mission was three missions away from where their theirs was, right? Well, there might have been an ulterior motive. So I <laughs> so oh. Well, I, I don't know. Doug probably doesn't want me to tell you this, but so I was, I had my, ah, he's not here. <laughs> he's not here. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my phone fell out of my pocket while I was in the capsule, uh, in the, oh, in the lockup. Okay. Yeah. And so I then owed some adult beverages to the crew that had to fish <laughs> that thing out. But, and so I got quite a bit of hard time come to find out later that that had happened to one Doug Hurley a little while earlier. So I think maybe he was just trying to swig that spotlight to me. So maybe <laughs> that's my theory. <laughs> He didn't give you an extra hard time, yeah. did he? Uh, he might have. Oh, yeah. he might have. Even so. Okay. No, but yeah, it, it was awesome, though. No, I mean, yeah. it just it was, uh, and you're exactly right. That that kind of mentorship is exactly uh, what we lean on in our office. Um, we have a term called IAs, which are instructor astronauts, and and those two epitomize that bringing bringing the whole core along with them, and and uh, they had the lessons from shuttle and. You know what worked, what didn't work. Um, they'd seen uh, Soyuz over the years, so I mean they had such a wide breadth of experience to to pull into what SpaceX and NASA designed. And while we're speaking about uh, honors that come out of the White House, Raja, you were nominated by the President of the United States for the appointment to grade of Air Force Brigadier General. It's a nomination, <laughs> so you're still waiting, uh, you know, Senate uh, approval, but uh, congratulations. Thanks very much, yeah. We're very humbled and proud to get to continue serving uh, in that next grade. So, yeah, excited to get to do that here at NASA. NASA's military astronauts. We have uh, a number of them here, you being one of them. Very proud to have you both serving our country and helping us explore space. Yeah, and we're, yeah, we love, we love our jobs. It's <laughs> And I can see why. This is an exciting time. Uh, certainly we talked about that. And we're taking a long look at uh, the hatch at the moment, probably making some uh, final uploads of the seal there. And as we do that, let's check back in with our Courtney Beasley at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Courtney. Thanks, Daryl. As we said earlier, the team here in Mission Control Houston is actively monitoring the International Space Station as they await Dragon's arrival. The crew aboard the International Space Station is currently in a sleep period, and they are scheduled to wake up at midnight central time. They have completed a number of tasks to prepare the station for Crew 6, like setting up tools to monitor Dragon's arrival and prepping the sleep stations for the new residents. Many of their clothes and other belongings launched on a previous cargo resupply mission. And then back here in Mission Control Houston, Flight Director Judd Freeling and his, his team are in constant communication with the SpaceX mission director for Crew-6's launch to the space station. Once we get into integrated operations, the NASA flight director will be conducting this series of go, no-go polls at the predetermined checkpoints for Dragon's approach. We'll continue to follow along from here in Mission Control Houston. And during our launch coverage, we like to highlight employees in the commercial crew program who are working behind the scenes to make today's mission possible. Earlier this week, Kennedy's Jasmine Hopkins spoke to NASA's recovery director for Crew 5. Let's take a look. Joining us now is NASA recovery director Brian Berry. Thanks for being here. Of course, thank you. Of course. So, uh, Brian, we understand that you are the NASA recovery director for Crew 5, but you've actually done a lot of things for human spaceflight. Can you tell us more about that? Sure. Yeah, that's right. So, I started my career as a flight controller for the ISS program. Uh, my team was responsible for maintenance on the space station. So I had the opportunity to uh, work directly with the astronauts, train them on 
tools and repair procedures. Um, so that was a lot of fun and something I never thought I would do when I was studying to be an engineer. Um, after that, I moved over to um, the safety team and I was our safety rep for the uh, commercial crew program safety panel. So that was my first exposure to CCP and I would go review the hazard reports for uh, Dragon and Starliner. Um, that was a pretty neat experience also because I was able to work with Bob and Doug prior to Demo 2 and just kind of work with them on the hazard reports and get their perspective on, on the risk and the mission overall. Um, after that, in 2020, um, I came out to Commercial Crew and I work for them directly now and I've been doing launch and recovery operations since then. Um, on the launch team, uh, my role is to lead the rescue effort if we need to, if there's a, a pad uh, emergency egress or a pad abort. Uh, the launch rescue director calls in the rescue forces, so that's what I did for Crew 5 launch last year. Um, and then as the recovery director, uh, I lead the NASA portion of the team that goes out on the ship with SpaceX. Uh, we bring out our flight surgeons and we check out the crew and we load them up on the helicopter and get them back home. Right, so you've worn a lot of hats for the commercial crew program. How did your work as a flight controller in Houston prepare you to be a NASA recovery director? Well, in Houston, um, working the ISS operations, you know, you see day in and day out in the control center, you get the full feel of the six month mission. Um, so you understand what the crew is going through for that long of a mission. And uh, I think I just kind of bring that crew perspective of the ISS side to the CCP program. Um, and so when it's time to bring the crew home, you know, we, we know we owe them a uh, smooth and speedy recovery. So that's our, our priority and our objective. Right. Brian, it's great that you have that personal relationship with them. What challenges do you and the recovery team have to be prepared for? Well, uh, the biggest challenge for recovery uh, for, for Dragon is definitely the weather. Um, we have to find a landing site where the winds are low and the waves are low. Um, so SpaceX has um, several landing sites around the state of Florida that we can look at and choose the best weather. Um, beyond that, you know, we start looking at things like contingencies if the crew is injured and we've got helicopters on standby for a medevac if we need to. Um, and then, you know, there's also just built in redundancy on the ship and, and throughout the vehicle. So, uh, but yeah, weather is definitely the biggest challenge for landing. Right. Now, weather is a huge challenge in Florida for a lot of things. And after a uh, crew five returns, Brian, you're going to transition to a new role in the commercial crew program, mission manager for crew eight. Can you tell us how you're preparing for that? That role begins 18 months out. So for crew eight, which launches, launches a year from now, we've already begun those meetings with SpaceX. And so. Uh, it's pretty exciting to be a part of that uh, that early in the mission and uh, yeah i'm just honored and, and proud to do that for the program of course well congratulations brian so glad to have you here tonight thanks jasmine thank you jasmine and we are currently now two hours and seven minutes in county as we watch the spacex closeout crew close the hatch to the dragon capsule dragon endeavor the flight leader in uh, SpaceX's fleet with flight number four today, hopefully get off the pad and notch another flight under its belt. Countdown is proceeding nominally at this point on board Dragon spacecraft Endeavor. We've heard the communication checks between the Dragon team and the crew. The astronauts, uh, you can see them seated. They were rotated into flight position. We had their suit leak checks that was successfully completed. Yep, and you heard the call from uh, <coughs> the core prior to the uh, hatch closing about making sure that the, all their loose items were stowed. That's kind of key because once that hatch is closed, if you drop anything, that's a, that's a problem. Um, so you can see right now they're probably updating their notes. Uh, the hatch is closed. You'll probably hear at some point SpaceX confirmed the hatch is closed. They're watching on the bottom of each of their displays. It always shows the flight computer state. And what that state tells you is uh, it's sort of major phases of that the vehicle is in, are, is in, and then it's important to the crew because only certain commands are available in a particular state. So once hatches close, and that kicks off the next sequence of events. I thought it was interesting you mentioned this uh, during our first launch attempt. There's a state that you move into where you have the emergency handle. Dragon is SpaceX, com check over ground station. That's one of those states. Correct, SpaceX Elliot. SpaceX Dragon, have you loud and clear over the ground station? But it's not active in all the states leading up, so it's certainly a very definitive point in exactly. time. The core has you loud and clear. Ground station com check is complete. Stand by for Tedris com check. Now we're rolling through the com checks. These are with the different uh, 
different paths. So we have yeah. checked via the hardline communication. Now the hatch is closed, so it's a the first one you heard was the ground. Now it's through TDRS, which is the S band communication system. So basically through satellites, and that's important because once it gets off the pad. Uh, Line of sight will work for a certain amount of time, but eventually you're going to have to rely on satellite communication. So they're checking that out before they get to orbit. Well afterwards, the SpaceX closeout team will be performing the final leak check on the hatch. And then once that is finished, you can see it there, it's closed. The team will begin steps to ready the access arm for the SpaceX com check. Dragon, have you loud and clear? Core, loud and clear. Teacher's comm check is complete. Stand by for comm checks with DC, MD, and LD in the launch configuration. And so what they're checking now, the MD is mission director, LD is launch director. Dragon, DC on countdown one, comm check. DC Dragon, have you loud and clear on countdown one? DC, loud and clear. Stand by for comm checks with MD. Now while this is Dragon, happening... MD on countdown one, comm check. The closeout team will leave the pad at T minus one hour, so they'll MD stay here. MD, Dragon, have you loud and clear on countdown one? They'll be with them for the next hour, and then leave at MD, T minus MD, loud and clear. Minutes. Stand by for comm check over Dragon the ground. Dragon, MD on Dragon the ground, comm check. MD Dragon, have you loud and clear over Dragon the ground? MD, loud and clear. Stand by for comm checks with LD. Dragon, LD on countdown one, comm check. LD Dragon, have you loud and clear on countdown one? LD, loud and clear. Stand by for comm check over Dragon the ground. Dragon, LD on Dragon the ground, comm check. LD, Dragon, have you loud and clear over Dragon the ground? LD, loud and clear. Dragon SpaceX, launch configuration, comm checks are now complete. SpaceX Dragon, copy. And so those two nets you hear him talk about, uh, as you can imagine, in, in both Mission Control, MCCX, which is in Hawthorne, and then MCC Houston. Uh, each of the flight controllers has a whole bunch of different channels they can be on. So dragon to ground is what the crew is typically talking on, and there's a whole lot of other comms going on that the crew doesn't need to hear. But those key people uh, have a net that does talk directly to the crew that's not dragon to ground. Countdown 1 is what they're talking on. And so for the launch, they tie those two nets together for the period of launch itself, uh, specifically to be able to tell the crew to initiate a launch escape. And uh, to your point, Daryl, you're exactly right. The handle that's between uh, Woody and Steve that you can't see in the view, it's up by the displays, is essentially like an ejection handle, so you can pull that and it'll initiate a launch escape, but exactly like you said, it wouldn't do it right now. You could pull the handle, nothing would happen. Um, so it is only armed, and that's we'll hear that later in the, in the count, uh, when they say LES armed, and that's why that's such a key thing, was that handle is hot, which is the manual initiation, but that also means the automated system is hot, meaning if the vehicle detected something, it would also automatically initiate uh, a launch escape. Um, but the reason they tie all those people together uh, is, especially during ascent, um, you want the quickest word to the crew if there's something that would tell them they should manual initiate escape. And that's why they make sure that those uh, those loops are properly tied. So it's on the ground that they're doing that. It's pretty much Dragon transparent SpaceX, to the crew. commencing health check for launch escape system. Expect momentary flight computer state change, followed by transition back to pad hatch closed. There's that state change we were talking about. Right. SpaceX Dragon will be watching, thank you. And so why that's, it, so they're not arming it yet, but what they're doing is checking the automated parameters. So they put it uh, into a mode to, to look at the automated triggers to make sure none of them are showing out of limits because right now sitting on the pad, it looks, it should be fine. So if there was something that's like a bad sensor or bad telemetry, you'd want to know that now before. before you put it into automated mode and then inadvertently trigger an escape. So that's what they're checking. So just like we talked earlier in the broadcast about the T-tab, you know, is it a bad sensor or is it actually a bad thing? That's what they're checking now, just to make sure there's no bad sensors in uh, the system that would initiate a launch escape. Curious, in your training, Raj, what 
what would constitute a, a moment where you would pull that handle versus it going off automatically? Uh, it would be for s like a s something uh, where, so there, are, there could be some situations where the rate is low enough that you, they, you, know, you know something's wrong, but it hasn't hit the threshold yet to mm -hmm. trigger it. So waiting for the automatic system is just taking extra time, so you might as well manually initiate. There could be some cases of fires where you would do it, where you recognize it before, uh, so especially like a fire, that might not trigger the automated system. I see, um, and or you can clearly exactly, see. Exactly, uh, or if there's a failure of the, the, s the communications, not the communication, like talking system, but basically the communication path, the interface between the vehicles, mm -hmm. where essentially it eliminates the automation and then you would manually do it. So there's, th there's a few cases you would be very, hesitant to do it you'd want to be very confident right because it's right. a oh, it is a uh emotionally significant event <laughs> <laughs> uh, both from a you know the it is um physically and physically yes yeah it is uh, a lot of g's very fast um and uh yeah so it, it's gonna rock and roll you quite a bit um so you don't want to do it uh if you're not positive but uh you definitely want to use it. It's a great feature to have um, and definitely one of the, the lessons we've learned as we've evolved um, our, our space and launch vehicle technologies. You mentioned speed, 436 miles per hour. That system can get up and go, take you two and a half miles off the coast of uh, you know Florida here into the Atlantic Ocean and uh, it could be a lifesaver uh, if the situation were to arrive. So this is certainly not child's play we're talking about here. This is, uh, this is big time stuff uh, when it comes to space flight. But, you know, every Dragon astronaut crew, even though it's not child's play, <laughs> does bring <laughs> a stuffed toy with them. This is true, yeah. <laughs> Making a tough transition <laughs> here. <laughs> that's uh, well, well done. <laughs> <laughs> the purpose of that stuffed toy, though, it, it, it has a purpose. When the toy starts floating, the strapped-in crew has confirmation that they've reached microgravity, and the name of it is a zero-G indicator. There's been seven on Dragon so far, and let's take a look at them all. Who can forget this one? A little guy, plush Earth, floating around by himself on the first uncrewed flight test in 2017 called Demo-1, which four years ago today, Raja, oh, wow. it was launched. Wow. That was followed up by a, se a sequin bedazzled dinosaur named Tremor, Picked out by Bob Binkin's son, Theo, and crewmate Doug Hurley's son, Jack. We just talked about that. Dragon, them. SpaceX, good side hatch leak check. Crew 1 took a toy Baby Yoda with them to the first four-person crew. SpaceX, Dragon, copies. And then, since then, it's been all stuffed animals. A penguin for Crew 2, a turtle, your turtle, for Crew 3. And then for uh, Crew 4, it was a turtle and a chimp. Double turtle. Double turtle. <laughs> and then for the last mission... The first humanoid, <laughs> the little <laughs> Albert Einstein, little thinker, plush doll. And so we didn't get to find out in our first attempt what Crew 6 is doing. Well, I'll be honest. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we're saving it until they get up into space. And we should see it we, you yeah, know, once they get exactly. up there. Exactly. Yeah, and the history of it is, uh, is you notice in some of those pictures, the crew was already out of their seats. But in reality, the when you first see it deploy, they're still strapped in. And so even though you in your stomach have that feeling of being in a roller coaster and you're falling, you aren't actually moving. You're still fully strapped in. So the way you can check your senses is your zero-G indicator starts to, starts to float. Um, and so in our case, uh, our turtle was named Fau, which was a nod to Matthias, since that's mm. uh, German. Mm -hmm. uh, it was also specifically a peacock turtle, because Tom Marshburn is a class uh, in the peacock. So it was a, a, a conglomerate of effort to have a, a zero-G indicator that represented the whole crew. You heard Arthur call the side hatch leak checks are good, which is a great sign. Um, and uh, it's going to take a while now for the closeout crew to actually clean out the white room. Um, there's a whole bunch of work they're doing. Um, as they start to, to do that, but it looks like everything's on track. Yeah, we've had the comm checks, the seat rotation, suit leak checks, they're complete. And uh, so now we're just tightening up that hatch. And while we look at this shot, we can look to the right. We see the NASA meatball with all the signatures around them, along with the SpaceX logo. Every human who goes into space gets to put their signature on the wall there. Raja, of course, yours is there, along with your crew three crewmates. But, you know, Dragon for the second SpaceX attempt, status update. they didn't have to do it. <laughs> yeah. So that helps save Bottom some time, time there as well. Great text, Dragon. Go ahead. 
All right, uh, we are going to repeat the ground station comm check uh, just to do it one more time on our end and make sure that we're properly configured. Uh, following the ground station comm check, I'll step into the post ingress crew briefing. And uh, after that, we'll step into Falcon 9 operator comm checks. Okay, thanks, Dragon Copies. I understand it all. Thank you. Going to run the. Uh Com checks again. Yep, so probably maybe they had to reconfigure something uh, or maybe someone wasn't on the or didn't hear it maybe, so they want to just make sure everyone's tied in. And then you heard the Falcon 9 operator com checks after that, which we haven't done, and that will be when you hear the different subsystems for each of the Falcon 9, ma the main parts that they're monitoring that could lead to a launch escape. They'll all chime in and again, so for the same reason I described before, making sure. Uh, normally those people wouldn't talk directly to the crew, oh. um, but if you had, you know, you know uh, one of those systems that give that that was your question like hey when would you do it like well that, that would be a time like if the GNC which is guidance navigation control ha see something off um, that they think is dangerous they can have the ability to call the crew directly and, and tell them to initiate a launch escape okay Great and again it'd be, it'd be like a trend they're seeing you know maybe it hasn't hit the automated limit um, but they know it's going to and just so if it buys you a second or two then it's worth worth it might that be call. faster than the automated system right and that's why they're consolidating the communications to the crew, as Raj has mentioned. We have uh, an hour and 53 minutes until liftoff at 12.34 a.m. Eastern Time here from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, America's spaceport. Now as the pad team wraps up its final checks and clears the white room, that's when the action will start to pick up. We're looking forward a little bit. Crew access arm will retract. We have the arming of the launch escape system. And then of course, prop load. So we will keep this live view of the crew here as they're sitting tight for the next hour or so. Raja Chari doing a great job of keeping us uh, informed about what's happening as we watch it. And if you want to ask him a question, we're taking him. Just head on over to social media. Oh, great question actually on there. So, so actually the ones that n one's not a question was a shout out from uh, Steve Bowen's uh, fellow submariners. Submariners. <laughs> um, looks like we've got one here that uh, from at Danny Scarra. Okay. Uh, what happens after you're strapped in and waiting to launch and you have to use the bathroom? So we get really good at using diapers. They're called mags. Uh, what are they called? Mags, which is the acronym for Maximum Absorbency Garment, but it's basically <laughs> a diaper. Uh, it's just that way you don't have to say the word diaper, but it's diaper. <laughs> um, Giving us some great insight yeah. there. Well, actually, if How you want, if the people at home, don't try this if you're watching the Cosmoway because there's fire ants. But if you're at home and you want to know what it's like, just get on your back, put your feet up on your couch, and lay on your back and watch this broadcast and do it for the next two hours. And even if you haven't drank a lot of water, sitting like that it's hard to it, do it's no it, it's hard to do and it makes you have to go to the bathroom oh um, so you definitely uh a, that's one of the reasons that crew we call it crew time on back is a big deal in trying to minimize that uh because you can get cramps this is uh definitely more roomy than a like a soyuz um where your knees are in your chest but yeah it is uh it is less than comfortable um and so you have to overcome the mental block of peeing your own pants um, <laughs> because it's actually harder than you would think. But <laughs> we, get, uh, we get practice doing that in NBL runs. So because you're in the pool for you get like- practice. Yeah, well, you're, when you're doing NBL runs, you're in that suit for like eight hours um, ah. in a mag also. So right. that's kind of where you start. Um, then actually when you're in training, uh, we, we call it like day in the life sims when you do like a whole day in the dragon. And so, yeah, you're, you get used to using it. Um, but that's exactly what you do. You saw the reason we cut away when they pulled up the pad is there's actually a trailer behind the launch pad where they can use the bathroom one more time um, before they go up the elevator. And you try to never leave a bathroom or a runway behind you uh, if you're flying. Uh, never leave, never pass up the chance to use a bathroom. But yeah, so it's a fine balance because you want to be hydrated, especially when you get to space, because you tend to get dehydrated. So you want a fluid load. Um, but the downside is that, uh, especially when you're on your back with your knees in your chest, um, it tends to give you the sensation that you have to go to the bathroom. This is an uh, incredible insight here, uh, Raj. Uh, and I imagine you've uh, created probably a little bit of stir uh, on <laughs> social <laughs> media <laughs> right now as people are <laughs> bandying about the, the answers and the insight that you just gave. But I will say this, in my time in being around astronauts, 
the whole bathroom and space uh, combination is one of the most consistently asked questions. Oh yeah, it, but right. it's actually a pretty it, big deal. I mean, yeah, it is, right. uh, I mean, as we look at Orion design and Artemis design, I mean, if the toilet breaks, I mean, you're coming home. I mean, you, you, you mm. right? right? If, if you get into orbit on the Orion <laughs> checkout and the toilets malfunction, I mean, it's a big that's, deal. That's a big deal. Yeah, it is a big deal. Um, I mean, it's if you look at uh, on the space station, that's one of the you know if the toilet goes down, that is all hands on deck to fix it because that is a big deal. I mean, if you've got seven people that can't go to the bathroom, things are, you only have so many diapers. I <laughs> can only imagine. Well, with that, let's head over now to Houston for a closer look at what the crew will be doing when they reach their destination. And that's where we turn to Courtney Beasley. Courtney? Thanks, Daryl. Once Crew-6 arrives at the International Space Station, they'll officially become Expedition 68 flight engineers. Once on board, they'll do something known as a direct handover, basically saying that Crew-5 and Crew-6 will be aboard the space station all together until Crew-5 comes home. Crew-5 will be able to give Crew-6 an orientation and show them the ropes, which might be particularly helpful for the three first-time space flyers on this flight. NASA's Woody Hoberg, UAE astronaut Sultan al Nyadi, and Roscosmos cosmonaut Andrei Andrei Fedayev. A direct handover also helps ensure a continuous U.S. presence on the space station, which is a record we've held for more than 22 years now. And as the station is first and foremost a laboratory, the crew will jump right into conducting experiments with new research still to be delivered on upcoming cargo flights. But for now, we'll toss it back over to Jasmine Hopkins, who's with NASA Administrator Bill Nelson. Jasmine. Thank you so much, Courtney. Yes, we're back here at Kennedy on the balcony of OSB2 and right now so honored to be joined by Administrator Bill Nelson. Thank you for being here. It's another pleasure. <laughs> of course, we we're always glad to have you back at Kennedy. And Bill, right before uh, we were tossed to you, you actually just mentioned that you've been in the shoes of these astronauts before, that when you were flying on shuttle, you scrubbed, it scrubbed four times. Uh, so do you have any words of wisdom, any words of encouragement for the astronauts tonight? Well, um words of encouragement enjoy yourself while you're laying there strapped in on your back uh, trying to get off the face of the earth but the serious words of encouragement is we don't fly until we think it's safe and that was what was important about the first scrub uh, because it just didn't feel right and NASA made the call it was the right call uh, everything's looking good. Uh, the supposed uh, problems that they had before have all been fixed. And so I expect we're going to see a launch tonight. Right, we're all looking forward to seeing that launch tonight, Bill. And all the work that we're doing in low Earth orbit on the space station is really paving the way for deep space. So what is next for Artemis? Well, we uh, have just this unbelievable opportunity now to go back to the moon, but this time it's different. First of all, we're going to a different place on the moon. It's the South Pole, and that's where we think the water is. And if you get to harvest water, all of a sudden you have hydrogen and oxygen. You've got rocket fuel. Uh, we're also going back for a different reason. We're going to stay there. We're going to learn to live, to work there, to invent, to create, all for the purpose that we're going to Mars. And, uh, you know, the moon's just a few days away. Mars is months and months away. And so that's why uh, this is so important for us to get back to the moon. It really is important. And right now we're also focusing on going together uh, in the commercial crew program this is the second time that we've partnered with uh, Roscosmos but the first time that we have a UAE astronaut on board can you talk about how these international partnerships really help NASA's mission uh, it's a different uh, mission you pointed it out not only by the way with our international partners but with our commercial partners because when we go to the moon with the NASA rocket we're going to go into lunar orbit and we're going to join up with a SpaceX lander and then our crew will then go down to the surface for six days. Uh, so it's, it's a whole new kind of program. Now internationally, this has become a big deal. You just can't imagine the enthusiasm around this globe 
with our foreign friends how popular NASA is. And they all want to be a part of this program, and most of them are. So tonight we have UAE and Russian astronauts, but uh, look up on the station right now. Uh, they're not only Russians, but there are, uh, there's also a Japanese astronaut up there. And so uh, it is a very international program, particularly on the space station, uh, because there we've got 16 international partners. Right, it really is important. We go further when we go together. Administrator Nelson, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thanks so much. Of course. Daryl, back to you. Thank you, Jasmine and Administrator Nelson. And we are now T-minus one hour and 44 minutes from launch as we uh, look at the pad here. Dragon on top of a Falcon 9 with a crew access arm. Attached at the moment, but getting ready to retract. As we look at it now, we want to also take a closer look at some of the life-changing science that astronauts are performing aboard the destination, the International Space Station. The International Space Station is a state-of-the-art microgravity laboratory that is unlocking discoveries not possible on Earth and helping us push farther into deep space. Every single day we are answering big questions about Earth and about space, about where we came from and about where we're going. But the other thing that we're doing is we're learning more questions to ask. Microgravity turns almost everything we know upside down. Liquids behave completely differently. Fire burns in new ways. Biological systems reveal surprises. There's a few things that have made me gasp out loud up on board space station watching heart cells actually beat has been a pretty big one. We're studying ways to grow food in microgravity. I gotta tell you, these, uh, these are pretty amazing. We're learning how human bodies react to life in space and how to keep crew members safe and strong on long duration exploration missions. Deadlifts are awesome on Earth. They're also awesome in zero gravity. We're testing technologies that will be critical to our return to the moon and great leap to Mars. Our research has contributed to medical and social benefits on our home planet, allowing us to find new ways to combat disease back on Earth and develop technologies to deliver clean water to remote communities in need. The spectacular vantage point of more than 200 miles above our planet supports our monitoring of Earth's climate, natural disasters, and plant life. The orbital perspective that we have here on the ISS is just absolutely amazing. Earth is gorgeous. The growing new space economy, so vital to our continued progress in space, is flourishing in low Earth orbit. We're inspiring future generations from a platform that is one of the largest international collaborations of our time. We're doing science at 17,500 miles per hour. Come along for the ride. Love the shot of the cells there, the heart cells beating inside uh, microgravity. It's uh, really impressive. And inside this dragon, three astronauts and one cosmonaut going up to the International Space Station to continue that important work of science on our orbiting laboratory. Well, there are astronauts in place and our cosmonaut getting ready for liftoff at 12.34 a.m. Eastern Time, Crew 6. Still got a ways to go. We've got to arm the launch escape system. Got to fuel up the rocket, count it down, and launch it into space. In the meantime, our next guest played a key supportive role in the development of the Falcon 9 rocket and Dragon spacecraft. And we visited with him on the first attempt, and he's back. His name is John Posey, and he's NASA's Crew Dragon lead engineer. Appreciate you having you back. Thanks for having me back. John, you were on the console yesterday as we counted down, or I'm sorry, not yesterday, Sunday, I should say, That's overnight right. during the first attempt. And we were just talking about, you know, how NASA and SpaceX works through something like that. Just to recap, there was a clogged filter for the engine ignition fluid. Um, that They saw the data, but weren't exactly sure at the moment what the cause was, found out later what it was, cleared it out, fixed it, and here we go again. 
How does NASA and SpaceX work through something like that? Dragon SpaceX, yeah, no confirm so when ready uh, for comm checks with Falcon 9 operators. On the, on the loops, on the net, talking to each other. Um, on the NASA side, the, the mission support team that uh, my team and I report up the, up the loop through the chief engineer to the NASA ops manager. The NASA ops manager is in direct contact with SpaceX. Uh, launch director throughout the whole count, you know, keeping apprised of issues that we can evaluate it as a team, make sure that both SpaceX and the NASA side get comfortable that we're good for crew launch. And so, like, as you said, uh, with the uh, igniter fluid, the T-TAB, the pyrophoric uh, fluid that they uh, load into the rocket to ignite the Merlin engines on Falcon 9's first stage, um, they, they provided the supply of the fluid and they were, uh, were expecting to see a good bleed in and start to see a response in the catch tank. Um, and at first they weren't seeing a response, did some troubleshooting and uh, started to see a little bit of response, but it was abnormal. So, you know, based on the, uh, the response of the catch tank and how that fluid fill was not really in family, you know, the, uh, the team talked through different scenarios, you know, what could happen if we don't have a, a full bleed in, what is the, uh, the appropriate course of action. So in the end, uh, I think the team made a really good call to, to stand down that attempt. Uh, and then, of course, since then, they've, they've gone into the system, uh, did find, you know, like you said, a clogged filter, a little bit more oxidation than typical. Um, and that's kind of expected over the course of that system's use. Um, and SpaceX does proactively go in and change that filter very frequently. Uh, this one got clogged a little sooner than normal. So uh, caught, caught us a little bit by surprise after, you know, having a, a good performance on static fire. But, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, things like that happen. There's so <laughs> many systems, so many systems yeah. uh, that have to be just right in exactly. order for a rocket launch to go off. So it is impressive when they have something like that and work quickly through it. Yeah, it's, it's, to turn it around that quickly is, is, is impressive. And like Kathy and multiple people said in light of this, it just reminds us space flight is hard. <laughs> Absolutely. And so John, now that you're returning for launch attempt number two, mm -hmm. how does the team reset for the next attempt? Yeah, you know, so the team has had a, a couple days to rest and get, uh, you know, eyes on the data from the first attempt, you know, very important. So, you know, we look through all the different uh, performance sensor blips, anything that there is to look at, make sure that we're good to go today. So, yeah, the team's on console. Uh, I talked, I checked in um, with the folks on console just uh, before coming on air and everything's been going great. So, you know, Dragon looks like it's ready to go today. And so we'll, we'll keep monitoring right through the the big phases, like you said, launch escape arm, and then uh, if the entire vehicle is ready and ev and everyone's uh, go for flight, we'll uh, we'll go get this off the ground today. And that's great news. The you know everything been going pretty smoothly so far. Our uh, weather and the ascent corridor is the one thing we're kind of keeping an eye on closely. Right. Keep an eye on a lot of things, but that one is the one that's kind of right on the line there. Um, but so far, looking like we're going to go forward for an attempt, and that's great news. We've got three consecutive days, right, that mm -hmm. we can do it now. So every 24 hours, we have an, an opportunity, a little less than 24 hours. And why is that, that we can go three days in a row? <laughs> well, you know, it's how the orbital mechanics work out, right, yeah. for getting to the station, you know, and uh, looking at the phasing times. The duration is important. You know, some days uh, the phasing time to get to the International Space Station would just be too long for the crew to be, you know, inside there for three, four days. So we try to get, you know, shorter opportunities. Uh, of course, you know, we've, we're protecting for contingencies, right? If the uh, if we go on a, a very long phasing and then had an issue docking, had to do a rendezvous, come back, had bad weather, you know, we protect for a lot of extra days of capability in the cabin, as uh, as Raja is well aware. So, you know, just protecting for those opportunities and picking the the best times to get the station. Well, we hope that this is the one, the yes. second attempt, and we won't have to visit those other two opportunities. John Posey, Crew Dragon lead engineer, thanks for being here for NASA, and uh, we know you're now headed on console, headed over there to do your job. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right, well, good luck tonight, and thank you again for being here. Right. And now we'll head out to our VIP location where our Jasmine Hopkins is with a pair of special guests. Jasmine. Thank you so much, Daryl. Uh, the energy is picking up here at OSB2 as we march closer to launch. And right now, I'm so glad to be joined by Salem Almari, the Director General of the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center, as well as Haza Al Mansouri, UAE astronaut. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you, Jasmine. Of course, Salem, we'll start with you. Uh, Sultan is the first UAE astronaut to go on a long duration mission to the space station. He'll be on a six month science mission. So, what is the UAE hoping to learn from him? 
uh, definitely there's a lot we plan to do during this mission and learn from him and from this six month duration. So uh, there's a lot of science we're going to be doing, a lot of human life sciences. Uh, there are science with over 20 different experiments with UA universities and international universities. So that's something really big for us. Uh, but we also have a very in-depth uh, education program where we, try, we will try and reach every school kid in the UAE. Uh, doing simple science experiments, uh, simple YouTube videos, and of course, uh, other than that, we'll do a lot of PAO events where we have these live chats with astronauts, with the astronaut from space, with our kids and uh, public. So I think there's, we're quite excited for this, uh, for this six-month duration mission. Right, a lot of excitement surrounding this. Haza, uh, you said that you've actually been able to speak to Sultan in the duration from uh, sun or Sunday or Monday's uh, morning attempt uh, to now. So how is he feeling uh, getting ready for launch again? Uh, Sultan, he's uh, super excited about his launch. It's going to be his first mission, uh, first mission for also Woody and uh, Andre Fedayev. They are super excited. Uh, they can't wait to to experience the weightlessness and to just to start conducting science and to conduct experiments on board the International Space Station. It is a really beautiful night for launch, so hopefully it's going to happen today. And uh, we are uh, looking forward to see them floating within a couple of hours. Yeah, we really are looking forward to that. It is a beautiful night for launch, so everybody's looking forward to it. Thank you both so much for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much. Of course. Daryl, back to you. All right. Thank you, Jasmine. And we are now T-minus one hour and 33 minutes until liftoff of Crew-6 from the Kennedy Space Center here in Florida. You're watching live coverage of the Crew-6 launch. We Monitoring heard. the crew inside, and uh, we've had some great, great interviews, but in the interim during that time, we heard that we're working no issues, and the team is moving forward through the countdown. Yep, and we heard uh, good comm checks. You heard uh, earlier, right before we interviewed uh, John, that they are going to redo the ground checks. So it sounds like those were done successfully, and uh, all checks were good. And uh, yeah, as you saw, you know, we mentioned in that ISS video the science going on there, and you can see underneath Woody's feet just some of the science. Um, so this on average each increment so they'll be part of expedition 68 and 69 when they get out there uh, running about 300 experiments in increment which is just incredible when you think about uh, you know what that national lab is doing up there and with having four people go up at a time just allows so much more bandwidth mm -hmm. uh, and science and I mean I think that's the reason I think most of us do the job just some exciting changing things. I think my favorite experiments we did up there I I call them dual purpose things so uh, some water uh, reclamation and then carbon dioxide scrubbing things and we were doing those things uh, because they help us with exploration so if we can have 98 percent of our water reclaimed then we can meet the mass margins to go to mars and if we can scrub co2 again we can we can live in on the moon and on mars but the cool thing about those technologies is if you scale them on earth i mean think about reclaiming 98 percent of our water oh, that, that is, uh, and or yeah. our, uh, solving our co2 problems i mean these are existential species changing technologies mm -hmm. and just th to the you know that we're just starting to get into the fundamentals of and if we can solve some of those problems i mean the the impact uh, nasa can have just on on the world let alone the solar system is is mind-boggling so i think that's to me why i love this job and why i think so much of us love doing this and the things you can discover in a micro gra and gravity environment um the even even simple things like uh we did a concrete hardening experiment when i was up there i remember which them. i thought at the time was like how <laughs> well, <laughs> why I, i'm sorry for whoever the poor side is like yeah, how lame <laughs> is this watch it literally watching concrete harden <laughs> but matthias who's a brilliant materials uh, scientist explained to me so that the reason we were doing it was to be able to use regolith on the surface of the moon to build structures mm -hmm. but the other cool earth science part is apparently concrete hardening releases co2 and it's a ridiculous amount of carbon we put in the in the atmosphere on the earth huh. just from the process of it hardening so one of the side benefits is this is figuring out better ways for concrete to harden and you think about all the developing places in the world if we just gave them a simpler concrete formulation that didn't emit greenhouse gases again just game-changing stuff so uh, really cool that you know each increment is going to do that and this national lab is just paying huge dividends besides teaching us how to live and work in space and get to the moon and mars but also changing our life uh, every day there have been spin-offs from space ever since you know the space program came into existence and it's amazing to hear just how many continue to come and benefit not just us but humanity yeah and it's uh, i mean that's actually more data than we know what to do with one of the common problems or not oh problems but people are like what's what's the most important experiment you did like I, <laughs> it's hard to say i mean every yeah. every day we're doing someone's life's work some universities you know years of research and we get to be the ones that actually finish the execution of it so it's just amazing experience up there
And what a privilege to yeah. be able to do that. We are currently at T-minus one hour and 30 minutes until Dragon flies its next four-person crew to the International Space Station. The astronauts, as we can see earlier, and now as we look at the spacecraft, there they are. Commander Stephen Bowen, pilot Woody Hoberg, and mission specialist Sultan al Nayadi and Andrei Fedyev. In their seats, they're strapped in, ready to go. And along our, la our launch timeline at the moment, we're getting ready to have those launch escape system and communication checks conducted by the Falcon launch team. And we'll be listening in for that call out. Yeah, so the closeout crew is presumably still working uh, items there and we expect around uh, at T minus an hour is when they would probably start departing. Um, and then that, that gives them time to clear out the, uh, what we call the hazard zone uh, before they start working the, the, the launch escape systems. Each Crew-6 astronaut is allowed to bring a few personal items with them inside the Dragon capsule there, and they do that so they can have something for their roughly six months in space, you know, something from Earth to remind them of family, friends, loved ones, something they love about planet Earth. And here's a few of the items that uh, Crew-6 is taking up. Sultan al Nayadi said he's bringing a kimono. <laughs> he's he's going to be throwing some moves up there, some jujitsu. He's also bringing a small toy rocket from the popular European comic Tintin. Andrei Fedyev is taking a few photos and some pins he plans on sharing with his family when he gets back home. For NASA astronaut Woody Hoberg, he's bringing one simple item, a photograph with deep personal meaning to him. In terms of personal items, mine's uh, simple. Unfortunately, over the summer, I, um, I lost my father, and uh, so I'm just bringing a, a photo of him that means a lot to me. And uh, I wish he could come along with me, but uh, at least I'll, I'll, well, I will be bringing him along yeah, with me. So. You will. Yeah. I'll, to, I'll talk this through. Yeah, and this is the photo right here, Raj. What he says, it's a picture of his dad, Jim Hoberg, finishing the Boston Marathon and leaving it all on the course. Jim Hoberg, along with his wife, Peggy, Ray's Woody and his brother in Pittsburgh, PA. He was an electrical engineering professor at Carnegie Mellon University, where he was known for his exceptional teaching. When he was 75 years of age, uh, he passed away at 75, I should say. Woody says he will remember his father for always showing up and for his relentless pursuit of truth. When he gets to space, he's going to keep that photo in his crew quarters, a touching tribute to his father all the way up there in space. Yeah, and I think what a, a tribute, and like we were talking about before, none of us got here on our own. Someone got us here, uh, and, you know, Woody's dad made Woody who he is. All of our parents made us who we are. The instructors at JSC, the centers we visit, uh, we are really just a, a reflection of them. So I, uh, I'm glad Woody's able to take his, his father with him. I think most astronauts take things to remind them of their family, their loved ones, up with them because you are uh, separated from the from the earth but uh, it's it's right there but you you can't go home at the end of the night so having that to remind you is very important now here's what we talk about what you brought up and we did this last time but yeah, i changed i had to change my show and tell yeah <laughs> I, I love that you did that by the way <laughs> what do you have so uh I, I last time i had my academy shirt i also had a high school shirt so uh, from I, you my, brought two I, shirts i had two shirts yeah okay so what, what do we have i'm a sailor so from, from okay. waterloo iowa yeah so i grew up waterloo in iowa, iowa yeah. that's right my high school shirt one thing so we, sh we showed these last time yeah the, um, showed my space retainer, <laughs> retainer. which <laughs> I, I was that. also not supposed to bring back. How can I forget? Um, so I did. I showed last time we had uh, the RMO for our mission. The other th one I brought up. So my wife works for the Department of Veterans Affairs, and that's obviously near and dear to my heart. The oh. agency itself. So yeah. I brought up uh, an RMO or a s coin. I'll say it out loud. But uh, <laughs> from from the Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, the other thing we bring up uh, that they ask some of the astronauts is uh, a Mach 25 patch and 100 day patches. And then you fly those and also things called silver Snoopies, which are pins that we give out to a very small percentage of the NASA workforce. So it's really special to get one that's flown in space and specifically from one that was flown by an astronaut for you. This is uh, similar, not a silver Snoopy, but a pendant with our patch on it. And we flew these uh, for some of the key people. So um, for some of the folks that helped with our mission planning and training. So you can see the three on there. Yeah. Um, and so the ones, that are yeah, and ones that are flown in space are obviously highly sought for. Uh, cards for my kids, 
ones. I had lots. Oh, of I didn't fun. see this. Yeah, one. these are different ones. I told, I told, I had lots. My 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 wife is is definitely my better half, and so I had all kinds of cards and notes for my kids, including. Oh, look at this, look at uh, what this one says right here. Can't wait. Yep, and a little landing one in the water. This one's the planets complete with the rings of Saturn. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know she loves her daddy because right here, this is the capsule. It says Crew 3 on it. And <laughs> here are the kids at the <laughs> bottom. And they have a little, they're saying, it's dad coming <laughs> home. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And then the uh, interesting one we didn't talk about, we talked about what uh, Nick Hague Ninja 12 is helping. Uh, but so a lot of us fly up with glasses. I don't wear glasses, but um, people have heard the term sans. So your eyes, your vision shifts in space. And so what happens it is shifts. it shifts. So what happens is the fluid in your body pushes up. And what can happen, or this is the leading theory, so we're actually still trying to figure out exactly wha what happens, mm -hmm. but the leading theory is that that fluid pushes against the back of your cornea and it changes the shape of your eye. And so they fly mm -hmm. us up, so I actually, these are glasses I had with me in the Dragon, uh, in the event that my vision shifted enough that I would have a hard time reading the display. Put those on real quick and show us what that uh, look is. I think like. they're just trying to humiliate me now. <laughs> yeah, so I, now I can't see the screen though, the teleprompter. So I'm oh taking yeah, back yeah, off. But yeah, quite I can uh, see up close really well. That's what it's meant for is is up close vision. Yeah. And and the strap, of course, to hold it on your face. Exactly. Because, this uh, is the space the space strap. The yeah, space exactly. <laughs> well, space <laughs> modified glasses. But did you have to use them? Uh, so actually, I used but. My my near vision did get worse, but not bad enough. I couldn't see dragon displays, but it would stress, it would fatigue my eyes using the laptops on station. So for about the first, from like uh, the first month, I'd wear them, and then my eyes adjusted and I stopped wearing them. But for about a month, I would just to avoid eye fatigue, and then once I got back, they they generally go back to normal. And well, that's good. And uh, we continue or to work on finding out. We do, yeah. What exactly the cause is? Uh, well, especially because we know they well. They generally go back to normal, but that's why we need more long-term data because we don't know on a two-year mission to Mars, like would it would it go back to normal? Are we are we confident? That what would happen there? Well, exactly. that's good stuff. Thank you for sharing yeah, the no new. I don't. Uh, hopefully, we won't have to get to a third <laughs> one. Not. We have to dig up some more stuff. But we appreciate your wife giving us a fresh <laughs> supply of stuff you took to space. Thank you very yeah. much. Well, when they aren't launching into space or working hard to prepare to go into space, the NASA astronaut corps, well, they try to find time to watch their friends go into space. And uh, you would know that. Yeah, so even, uh, so I'm here, but, uh, you know, we saw Nick as uh, Ninja 12. We saw Ike Glover helping with the family sport. We saw Joe Akaba, the chief. Sharon, uh, this is Jen when they Wap were getting ready right, to go Right, exactly. Out, yeah. So the office is spread out doing all kinds of things. You have, uh, you know, last time Reed was up with the administrator. Reed um, Wiseman. Yeah. Exactly. So we are all over the place. But even if you're not, you're probably online or at home watching. And so I was going to try to dial in. So Woody, as we talked about, uh, is sitting in a seat that's been used before. So I was going to try to get. You're not calling Woody, are you? I'm not. Well, I don't think <laughs> I could try call. <laughs> I don't know the answer. I'm she's a, a, I'm she's a on the line. Awesome. I'm All right. Yeah. Okay. So we got Megan MacArthur on the line who flew on Crew 2 that I got to train with. And so, M Megan, can you can you hear me okay? Hey, Raj. I got you loud and clear. Hey, awesome to talk to you. Thanks <laughs> for calling. So Megan's at home Absolutely. and Houston watching the launch. Um, and we're, yeah, you might have better ideas about what they're doing. Uh, I think you guys came up with a game to kill some time while you're waiting for the closeout <laughs> crew to leave. Yeah, well, it's been it's been enough time that you know when you first get in, of course, you're all business and you go through your checklist and you review the nominal timeline and you you uh, of course review the contingency actions that you might have to take. But uh, but now you're into just the wait. <laughs> just and uh, you know I was lucky enough to fly with a really fun and fun loving crew, and so um, we just we set about entertaining each other. <laughs> and, uh, yes. We had Tomas, kind of our Julie, the cruise director. And he had us playing a, a variety of different games that I'm not sure if he made them up or these are French games or what, but he, he kept us well entertained. It looked like the French version of rock, paper, scissors. I'm not sure if that's what it was. but Well, that's what yeah, so it's called the Game of Thumbs, and I won't, okay. I won't um, strain anybody by trying to say that en français, but uh, the Game of Thumbs. And so, yeah, it's a little bit like rock, paper, scissors. Well, Megan, you're watching us, uh, you know, get ready to launch Crew 6. And, uh, of course, you know, you were, you were on Crew 2, and, and what a mission that was. And uh, uh, what's it like to, to be where you are, kind of relaxing, uh, getting ready to watch the astronauts go up? It's, it's so exciting. It's so much fun to see your friends go into space. Um, of course, Steve is a classmate of mine. And Woody uh, was my family escort. Actually, he was with my family when I was oh. getting to launch in that in that very same seat. 
And so my son in particular is very excited to get to watch Woody launch, so he's made me promise. I had to peel him away from the screen to get him to go to bed um, with the promise that I would wake him up in time to watch the launch. So we're excited for all four of the crew members of Crew 6, and we, and we can't wait to see them get started on this next phase of their adventure. Very cool. That's yeah. awesome. And you know what? Uh, we are counting down just one hour and 20 minutes to go until uh, liftoff. And, uh, you know, i got to ask you, Megan, How's Raj doing so far? Because you were one of our co-hosts <laughs> sitting in this seat. So you want to you wanna grade him live on the air? You could, you could text me oh any man. critique. Oh, <laughs> man. How could it be anything else? He's just doing amazing. We are, <laughs> like I said, I had to peel my kid away from the screen. And, of course, he, Raja, he recognized you as the guy that cut his oh, hair. Oh, that's right, yeah. Um, so before Daddy came home. His, so. <laughs> his uh, quarantine cut, yeah. I still don't pay for that's haircuts. Right. I cut that my own hair. Haircut, yeah. Theo was a test case, yeah. Megan was nice enough to let me test out my haircutting skills on her son. You, really? Wait, wait, yeah. wait. Wait, wait. <laughs> he didn't tell me that. <laughs> no. no, don't worry. I, did you I, use I tried. I, I did it on other kids. Theo was the first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you cut your hair in space. Remember, you, like, you, did you, you? There's some kind of Floby thing that you it's use. Yeah, it's basically a Floby. Yeah, it's a wow. very loud Floby. Yeah. And Megan, were you tr doing your hair in space? No. Oh no, no, okay. no, no. Huh? We yeah. just let that grow. Yeah, just let it grow out. And uh, I remember seeing oh, the yeah. shot of you, just your hair just flowing freely, and uh, it's a great shot of you floating around. Doing your yeah, business? I often feel like my hair deserves its own credit, you know, in the <laughs> in the credit line, like Megan and Megan's hair, because it's a whole entity on its own. <laughs> Got a lot of traction cool. there. Well, Megan, I just want to let you know that I brought lots of snacks, courtesy of my wife, Rachel. She packed me up a big bag here. I know you took a shot at me when your husband uh, <laughs> co-hosted, so I want you to know I'm, I'm in good hands. <laughs> awesome. Can't have you getting grumpy. <laughs> no, no, ma'am. Thank you very much. Well, Megan, we really appreciate you joining us uh, this evening, watching the launch from home. Uh, thank you so much for being on the broadcast with us. Thanks, Megan. I'll see you All back right, in Houston. All right, you guys are doing awesome. Take thank care. You. All right, Megan MacArthur, Crew 2 pilot, uh, and uh, did a fantastic job for us as a co-host, completed an amazing mission. She did a ton of work uh, working with kids, uh, especially afterwards. She's really leading an effort in education. Um, great having her on the broadcast. Hey, take a look at this. This is uh, Crew6's patch. And we want to talk about how this came into existence. You know, it's very unique. Each patch for each mission, every flight has one, and it's designed by the crew. So you can see the one for Crew6, and what you'll notice right away is the wooden dragon ship with the dragon figurehead there. And that's because each crew, six member, has an affinity for seafaring vessels. And then check out the anchor. It's the International Space Station. You see it there. And then lastly, the sail represents the three planetary bodies of Earth, Moon, and Mars, the ultimate destination of NASA's Artemis program. I like that call forward to where we're going, even though this is a mission to low Earth orbit. Yeah, it's, I think you'll, that's a common theme in a lot of the patches. You'll see like a reference to Moon, Mars, uh, Orion, some, something like that. This, uh, because this is, we definitely see this as a stepping stone to, to go beyond low Earth orbit. I mean, that's one of the cool things about commercial crew is we are putting private industry to low Earth orbit so that NASA can, can focus resources and people on exploration and going beyond low Earth orbit. That's right, and we're just one hour and 17 minutes until liftoff of Crew 6. Hearing good things about the countdown as we go along the way. The crew has ingressed, helped by our closeout team, of course. The umbilicals are attached. They provide the breathing air and comms to Dragon and the astronauts. Suit leak checks completed, comms checks completed with the core and the launch director. After those suit leak checks, the closeout team was able to close and seal the hatch, which has its own leak check. They made sure to look for any FOD that might be there, and FOD stands for Foreign Object Debris. As we look in from the white room, the closeout team will wait another 15 minutes before they'll clear out of that area. You saw those orange bags, so there's no, uh, the people are starting to move out of there, but you saw those orange packs uh, in that previous view just to the right on that wall. Those are actually breathing uh, apparatus in case they have to uh, emergency egress, that they can actually hook into their suits and get breathing air uh, to get all the way off the pad. So we understand that the closeout team has actually departed the pad, and now they're doing some final weather checks. That'll be necessary before they give that final go, no go, 
for launch. Going to put the balloons up into the air. The winds have picked up a little bit, but not too bad at all. Yeah, and a, and a great example, uh, continuing to run ahead of timeline, and specifically that closeout crew already being done much earlier than last time. But again, that's their, you know, you can tell it's a well-oiled machine now. They had the practice from just doing this uh, two days ago and now uh, doing it again. Um, when I talked to Steve about, you know, what they've been up to in between, uh, Talking about Commander Steve Bowen? Commander Steve Bowen, yeah, yep, between uh, now, last attempt and now. Um, his perspective is very similar to what we talked about uh, the other night. You know, basically an, another free training sim event. And mm -hmm. Steve, um, actually, like I mentioned before, he was the lead closeout person. So he was in that white room uh, for SDS 127, which had six attempts. Uh, and so he, he mentioned that he act, that the crew actually got sick of seeing his face because he was always the first person <laughs> to open up the hatch on the shuttle and they would see him leaning in. But I think, uh, you know, he brought up uh, similar to what we talked about. I think everyone on the crew was actually impressed by the fact that, you know, no one had go fever, no one you know, down at two minutes, but no one was like, oh, we should just go. Like, like the administrator said, we go when we're absolutely ready um, and, uh, you know, we have an abort system, but you definitely, or an no, launch escape system, but you don't want to rely on that. Right. Uh, you want to rely on making the right engineering dis decision. Um, and so he actually, you know, talked about the fact that, uh, you know, yes, it's the sixth operational crew mission, but every one of these missions is really a test flight. We're always learning new things. Now we learned about, uh, you know, oxidation rates of T-tab right? line filters, you know, so you're always learning something new. Um, we talked last time about like even the, the procedures they're using. So they're in a procedure called 4.100 and just in the last launch to now, they've changed the section numbers of that. So we're always iterating and improving and trying to figure out ways to, to do it better and more efficiently. Like you mentioned tonight, we're doing things in parallel, which is why now we have some time. So um, it seems like we're ahead, but if we had had a problem with the side hatch closer or s had had a problem with the leak checks, we, this would all be time that we could use now to, to not be rushed. Um, so it's, uh, it's great to keep iterating and practicing and learning. It's hard to imagine when you have a launch scrubbed that uh, so much can come from it that's good. Talking about that data, we heard uh, NASA's Dragon lead engineer talk about how they've been pouring over the data. Uh, we've had a dry dress, essentially a wet dress in the first launch attempt, and uh, as you mentioned, always iterating and always learning. All right, we want to check in now with our friends in Houston, Texas, in the Johnson Space Center. Courtney Beasley is standing by. Courtney? Thanks, Daryl. The team here in Mission Control Houston has pulled that they are go for launch. The International Space Station is ready for crew six astronauts to lift off. When Flight Director Jed Freeling pulled his team, he was asking the flight controllers who work on all of the key systems on board the station if their focus areas were online and working properly. This includes life support systems, proper communications links, computers that allow us to command the station's onboard subsystems, and our ability to, to control and maneuver the space station are all fully functional. The crew in orbit is currently in a sleep period and they are scheduled to wake up at midnight central time. The International Space Station Flight Control Team is ready for launch. Mission Control Houston will continue monitoring the mission as we check off milestones for today's flight. In the meantime, I'll send it back out to the team at Kennedy. Daryl. <laughs> All right, a beautiful shot from uh, high above the Kennedy Space Center going by the VAB as we look out at Launch Complex 39A during the previous launch attempt. I want to recall this, Roger told us that dragonflies during dry dress is a good luck charm. Well, after the scrub, I was watching <laughs> you know, the Starlink yes. launch. What do you see there? Looks like some, looks like some insects flying by, maybe dragonflies. Yeah, I can't tell if they're uh, insects on the screen, or there you go, <laughs> there's yeah, right there a yeah. buzz, right? they, were, they were buzzing my phone. I thought it'd be a good <laughs> idea to put some dragonflies in For the show, good Roger. luck, I like it, yeah. Is that gonna bring you some good luck? I sure hope so. <laughs> well, let's hope so indeed. One hour and 11 minutes, uh, counting until liftoff. Let's check back in with Jasmine Hopkins, who has a special guest. Thank you so much, Daryl. Joining us now is Kennedy Space Center Director Janet Petro. Thanks so much for being here, Janet. Thank you, Jasmine, for having me. We're always happy to have you. And you know, right now we're, we're preparing for take two, second launch attempt of Crew-6, but this is something that the Kennedy workforce is built for, really. I mean, we're very agile. Can you speak to that? Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, last year, 60th anniversary, we went through this with Artemis, not just uh, uh, two times, but we did it three times successfully, launching the third time on November um, 16th. So. 
launch us hard the whole process and we got to get it right um, you know they say you know you'd rather fix a problem on the ground than um, launch and then have a problem in the air so the team um, you know the NASA team along with the SpaceX team has worked really hard we had our uh, Delta launch readiness review um, late yesterday evening worked through the issues that we experienced on the first one and we're ready to go tonight Jasmine that is what we want to hear it's good to hear that we are looking good for launch tonight Jen and you just mentioned that 60th anniversary was our diamond anniversary last year uh, to think that we've been here six decades what is Kennedy doing uh, to continue growing and improving? So the first 60 years, you know, it started, Kennedy was with Apollo, and then Diamond Anniversary last year, Artemis, first launch of Artemis, going back to the moon. But, you know, as a spaceport, we really have come into our own. We've really um, brought a lot of the commercial industry here to launch. Um, 97, uh, 94 launches on the manifest this year. Um, we had 57 last year, like you mentioned, 31 the year before that. So we are growing. We obviously are a very popular place, not just because of the geography, but the services that we're providing at the center to our commercial partners and customers. Um, we're working very hard to make it easy for them to launch and to provide them the best services. And I got to brag for a moment. Uh, we have a spaceport integration team. They coordinate with the um, uh, 45th uh, SLD, the Space Force side. Every single one of those 90 plus launches uh, will be supported by our Kennedy um, uh, team as well as the Space Force side. We work jointly together in partnership to ensure that all of those um, launches are successful. And of that 90 plus, 79, uh, 79 are commercial. So a large, large number percentage of that is a commercial launches. And so Across the board, we have our NASA, we have our government, we have our national um, space security missions we support, but we also have the commercial that we have to take care of also. Right, Janet, I mean, those numbers just really blow me away. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you, Jasmine. Of course, always happy go, to have you. Go Crew 6. Uh, exactly, go Crew 6. <laughs> Daryl, back to you. Thank you, Jasmine and Janet. Throughout the show, we've been taking your hashtag AskNASA questions from social media. And we have time for a few more before Falcon 9 fueling begins at T-minus 35 minutes. We're sitting now at 108 and counting. And Raja, there's the question. It seems like astronauts work on some really cool and interesting things other than flying. Raja, can you take a minute and talk about something interesting that you're working on right now? You're not flying, currently right. on a mission, obviously, because you're here. <laughs> what are yeah. you working on? Yeah, so I'd say most of our time is not actually flying in space, so we do maintain the training for that, whether it's uh, NBL, which is the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, so doing uh, practice spacewalks in there, uh, whether it's working on the ISS systems, uh, working on uh, different experiments, getting smart on geology, biology, uh, but we also all work on different projects in the office on the engineering and development program, so specifically, there's a whole lot of work going on in Artemis right now. Uh, the administrator talked about Artemis, that is, that is the goal of the agency to get us back to the moon to stay and go on to Mars. Uh, so there's the SLS, which is the rocket. There's the Orion, which is the capsule. Uh, there's the gateway, which is the lunar space station. And then there's the HLS, the human landing system, which is the lander. So that's my particular job right now is helping with uh, lunar lander development and testing. Uh, and so I, I, lo I love my job. I love, <laughs> I love to fly space, but I also love my, my day job. And so that's, uh, you know, we're doing all different kinds of things. There's uh, folks working on the lunar exploration suits. So those are the space suits for the surface. So mm -hmm. we, we're not going to use, you know, we talked about there's IV suits, which are for in the vehicle. There's EVA suits, which is what we use on the space station. And we are working on lunar suits because those are, that's different than either of the ones we have. And so if we get to the moon, we are going there to do science. And so we need to get out there and go do the science. So that's another uh, big project that people are working on. Um, and yeah, so it's, uh, we are spread all over the place. Uh, training and working with all these development teams. Yeah, and it, and it seems like there's a similarity there to when, you know, Bob and Doug were working in the commercial crew program early on developing these vehicles. You're very early on in the HLS system, so, you know, it's uh, it's got to be kind of exciting to be working on the next thing that's going to land on the moon. Yeah, I think all of us enjoy it. That's why it's fun to do these things. You yeah. know, and our, our job is in the office is to fly in space, but also to bring the crew's perspective, the operational perspective, to all these programs and to uh, to these efforts to make sure that we're, you know, the, the human is the important part of human space flight. And so keeping that in mind and, and keeping that at the forefront is always really important and, and that's why it's important to have us tied into all those programs. And for those of us, uh, for those of you who are watching and for those of us who are enjoying watching, if you want in on the social fun, follow us on Twitter at NASA Social or check us out on the web at nasa.gov forward slash social forward slash social. <laughs>
Hey, this is a really quick question, a really easy one. At Slow asks, Raja, what inspires you? What inspires me? I think uh, the idea of exploring is what in inspires me, the idea of new discoveries, and I think I kind of alluded to why I'm so excited about science before, solving problems here on Earth. So I'd, I would love to see humanity go and explore, like live on the moon, go to the next planet, but I also am inspired by the fact that we're, we are finding solutions for problems here on Earth right now. So that's, uh, that's what inspires me to, to work here. And it must be rewarding as well. It's amazing, yeah. I, so I think it, what inspires me is inspiring others too. So I think one of the co coolest parts of our jobs, uh, it takes time and effort because it's you're traveling, but going to talk to like school kids, I, that's hands down one of my the most my most favorite things um, really? to go do. And just yeah, I mean seeing their excitement, um, just the when an astronaut walks in the door, it's just so fun, you know. And, yeah. um, you know, whether it's elementary answering bathroom questions, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> I've heard plenty, uh, all, all, the all the way to, you know, talking to university students uh, who have questions like, you know, how do we, like, where do I go and like what kind of degrees and, you know, so it's, it is, uh, it is really cool um, and it's, it inspires me to be uh, even a potential inspiration or to potentially help or set a spark maybe uh, uh, in someone's mind or give them the idea of what's possible. Deep curiosity as well. We are one hour and four minutes and counting until liftoff. This day is the continuation of regular flights to the space station from U.S. soil. Crew 6 and the mission will be the company's sixth crewed space flight. This is for, of course, SpaceX and NASA following the crewed test flight, Demo 2, and four previous operational crewed missions to the space station. It will also be SpaceX's eighth crewed space flight overall, including the private orbital mission, Inspiration4. Today, our crew is uh, flying on board Dragon Endeavor, and this will be the fourth flight for this capsule. And it'll be taking a ride on a brand new Falcon 9 rocket. The Dragon is the flight, this particular Dragon, Endeavor is the flight leader in the fleet. It's fourth flight, which includes Demo 2, Axiom 1, been a great countdown so far. One hour and three minutes and counting. Weather is fantastic here at the Kennedy Space Center. Only a 5% chance of violation. That means 95% go. Doing some math here, getting inspired by my fellow <laughs> astronaut here. Really advanced stuff. Avoid math in public. That's my rule. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> Excitement is picking up, though, as we get uh, closer to T0. And so with roughly about an hour, sorry. No, no, go ahead. About an hour to go until liftoff, things are going to start picking up. We get close to the go, no-go pole to arm the launch escape system and begin the propellant loading. The crew pole for readiness, that will happen right at T minus 60 minutes. And then the dragon pole for prop load is at T minus 55 minutes. From there, at T minus 45 minutes, there will be an internal mission control Hawthorne pole, and then the launch director's pole for propellant loading will follow. When we get to about T minus 40 minutes, the crew access arm will retract, and the crew will get the call to close their visors and to arm the launch escape system. We're going to walk you all the way through it. This is the automated safety system that's in place that can fire the eight Super Draco thrusters on Dragon to quickly separate the crew from the rocket either on the pad or during a flight on the ride uphill. And then, once we reach about T minus 35 minutes, propellant loading for the Falcon 9 will begin. Thanks for tuning in. You're watching live launch coverage of NASA and SpaceX's sixth rotational flight of astronauts and one cosmonaut to the International Space Station. We are T-minus one hour and counting until liftoff. And with us today is NASA astronaut Raja Chari. 
Raja, thanks for coming back. Yeah, glad to be back, hoping to see my first launch. Indeed, and if you didn't know, Raja is getting ready to witness his first launch. He rode on a rocket as we turn the corner from the vehicle assembly building to show off the launch pad just beyond it. Oh, this is a great shot. With the big reveal. Look at that. There certainly oh, is. Cool. There it is. The Launch Complex 39A holding for a 1234 a.m. Eastern Time liftoff. And so right now the crew is uh, going through kind of mentally, uh, you know, probably looking forward to the prop Dragon timeline. SpaceX and you cycling the orbit tank isolation valves to equalize low flow pressure. Dragon copies Quickly explain what that is. So give them that call. So uh, a lot of times whenever they're going to do something with any prop loading or valves, they'll give the crew a heads up. So if they hear the sound or feel the vibration, that they know that that's planned. So they usually give them a call prior. Uh, you mentioned that it's about to get a lot busier on the loops as they start going through some go-no-go pulls and uh, talking to the crew. And so they are looking ahead in what's called the event details, and they have probably two displays up, one that's event details, one that's in procedure 4.100. They're sitting in 4.100 waiting for the pole to say that they can arm the LES, the launch escape system. And on the timeline, they're probably looking at what the prop loading steps are and just kind of anticipating what's coming up next, probably scrolling ahead to kind of talk through the launch sequence and using this time to basically what we call chair fly, uh, talk through. Uh, Dragon SpaceX, you are go for section five. When ready, report go for launch. All right, picking up sector five, preparation for LES arming. All right, great insight into what's happening in Crew Dragon right now, but we want to recap the last three hours. Our crew of Stephen Bowen, Woody Hoberg, Sultan Al Nayadi, and Andre Fediev have been getting ready to launch into space after waking up and having a meal. SpaceX helped the astronauts into their suits, and then you see them here walking out the historic crew quarters, walking the same path that every NASA astronaut has done since Apollo 7, waving to family and loved ones as well as to the cameras there to document their journey. Then you see them here inside their Teslas, joined in a caravan as they went down the road, led by center security, until they arrived here at Launch Complex 39A. They did the rocket recline, went up the tower, and walked down the crew access arm here. Woody Hoberg and Stephen Bowen crawling into Crew Dragon. And then once inside, they got strapped in, got their suits checked, comm checks, and now we watch as the Dragon spacecraft sits on top of the Falcon 9 rocket getting ready for fueling and arming of the launch escape system. At this time, we are expanding our coverage and would like to welcome SpaceX and NASA commentators who are joining us live from Hawthorne, California. Welcome to you both. Hey, thank you so much, Daryl. And hello to everybody watching around the world. I'm Gary Jordan with NASA's Communications. And I'm Jesse Anderson, a production and engineering manager here at SpaceX. Gary and I are joining you today from our headquarters in Hawthorne, California. While Crew 6 marks SpaceX's sixth operational mission for NASA, it's actually our eighth human spaceflight mission to the International Space Station and overall 34th Dragon mission to the orbiting laboratory. And the Dragon supporting tonight's mission will be making its fourth visit to the station, having previously supported Demo 2, Crew 2, and Axiom Mission 1. And Speaking of Demo 2, the spacecraft was named Dragon Endeavor by Bob and Doug during its inaugural flight in May of 2020. And yet another fun fact, tonight's launch marks our four-year anniversary of the Demo 1 mission, which launched on the same day, just a couple of hours later than we're launching today, which served as an end-to-end -end test flight of Dragon's capabilities. Since Crew 1 in November of 2020, SpaceX has been regularly flying commercial crew missions for NASA to and from the International Space Station at an average cadence of about one flight every six months. It took a lot of love and dedication to get here today, and we are still learning and innovating from every launch. From the beginning, Dragon was designed to eventually fly people to help further our ultimate goal of making life 
multiplanetary. The dragon hanging from the ceiling behind us was initially flown to certify SpaceX for cargo missions to the space station over 10 years ago. It flew back in 2010, but it included a window because the vehicle had been designed from the beginning to fly crew. We always knew that this was the direction that we wanted to go in. As we continue the countdown to liftoff, we'd like to welcome you to SpaceX Mission Control in Hawthorne. This is where our teams are staffed around the clock to monitor Dragon and the mission overall. On console or headset in Mission Control are six key positions. The mission director is in charge of the room and tasked with making real-time decisions to ensure mission success. The person that you may hear talking to the astronauts is the crew operations and resources engineer, who you'll hear us refer to as the core throughout the broadcast. And the four additional team members are focused on vehicle systems, including avionics, navigation and control, software, propulsion, life support, and communication with ground support teams. Apart from Mission Control, our Falcon 9 team is currently located in Firing Room 4 in the Launch Control Center at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Now, with less than an hour until launch, they are settling in for final checkouts, propellant loading, and for launch. And then, of course, NASA has its own team members at NASA's Mission Control Center in Houston, Texas, who have been preparing the space station for Dragon's arrival. And they recently gave their go for launch, saying that the station is ready to receive the new crew. Upon liftoff, today's ride to the space station will take about 24 and a half hours, with Dragon flying autonomously the entire way. And just like autopilot on a commercial aircraft, the crew always has the ability to take manual control of the spacecraft if needed. Now at under T minus 55 minutes, we are looking good for an on-time liftoff, and our very own incredible Kate Tice has been monitoring the progress of the countdown. How's it going so far, Kate? Thanks, Jesse. I'm Kate Tice, SpaceX Quality Systems Engineering Manager, bringing you vehicle status updates this evening. It's been a pretty smooth countdown so far. The crew six astronauts wrapped up ingress at T minus two hours and 34 minutes. Since then, the teams completed the required comm checks, suit leak checks, and side hatch closure, as well as side hatch leak check. The closeout team has departed the BDA and the pad is clear. Now, as for Falcon 9, our two-stage reusable rocket that you see there on your screen, final propulsion checkouts of first and second stages began a few minutes ago in preparation for propellant loading. This involves testing valves and engine pneumatic pressurization. Now, as you might be able to guess from the lack of re-entry soot on Falcon 9's first stage, which is the lower two-thirds of the vehicle there, that booster will be flying for the first time tonight. Now, at T-minus 45 minutes, less than 10 minutes from now, the team will report their readiness for prop load with a final electronic go-no-go no go poll. Before we can begin propellant loading on Falcon 9, we still have a couple tasks to perform. First, the crew access arm will be moved out of its service position as you see it in now, and it will rotate away from the Dragon capsule and over to its launch position. That will happen between T minus 44 and 42 minutes, almost immediately after the T minus 45 minute launch director's briefing. With the access arm out of the way, the launch escape system will then be armed. Once those two events are complete, Dragon will be ready for Falcon propellant loading. As for weather, we will also verify with the launch weather officer that all of the weather conditions meet our launch constraints. Those include items such as wind speed, lightning, and precipitation in the area surrounding pad 39A. But tonight, we're expecting uh, acceptable weather conditions for launch, both at surface level and upper altitudes. Uh, once again, our uh, probability of violation of those conditions is only 5%, so looking good. The range is currently clear for launch. A worldwide network of ground stations and tracking and data relay satellites, or TDRIS, are ready to support. And those are what help us get live views and data as Dragon heads into orbit. Today, we have an instantaneous launch window at 12.34 a.m. Yeah. Eastern. As I've said before, once we begin propellant load, there is no opportunity to change the T0. The timing for Dragon to rendezvous with the International Space Station is down to the exact second. So today, we only get one chance. But the good news, at T minus 51 minutes and 32 seconds, uh, we and counting, uh, we are go for launch. 
Great news, thanks, Kate. Today's launch marks the sixth time a rotational crew will fly on a commercial spacecraft. And much like our previous crews, today's crew has been training with our teams at SpaceX for the last several months, running nominal and emergency simulations of what the full mission will look like while seated inside of Dragon. And as with every mission, each one of our crew members brings a diverse set of experience to today's flight. That's right, and let's start with the mission's commander. Steve Bowen was born in Cohasset, Massachusetts. He holds a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the U.S. Naval Academy and a master's in ocean engineering from the Joint Program in Applied Ocean Science and Engineering at MIT and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. In July 2000, Bowen became the first submarine officer selected as an astronaut by NASA. This will be Bowen's fourth trip into space as a veteran of three space shuttle missions, STS-126 in 2008, STS-132 in 2010, and STS-133 in 2011. Bowen has logged more than 40 days in space, including 47 hours, 18 minutes during seven spacewalks. As mission commander, he'll be responsible for all phases of flight aboard Dragon from launch to reentry. Warren Woody Hoberg is from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He earned a bachelor's degree in aeronautics and astronautics from MIT and a doctorate in electrical engineering and computer science from the University of California, Berkeley. He is also a commercial pilot with instrument, single engine, and multi-engine ratings. The mission will be Hoberg's first flight since his selection as an astronaut in 2017. As pilot, he will be responsible for spacecraft systems and performance on Dragon. Sultan al Niadi will be making his first trip to space, representing the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center of the United Arab Emirates. Aboard Dragon, he'll serve as a mission specialist, working to monitor the spacecraft during the dynamic launch and re-entry phases of flight. He spent time in the UAE military prior to becoming one of the first two individuals selected by his country when they started their space program just a few years ago in 2017. al Niadi will be the first UAE astronaut to fly on a commercial spacecraft. Andre Fedyaev will be making his first trip to space and will also serve as a mission specialist monitoring the spacecraft during the dynamic launch and reentry phases of flight. He was selected as a cosmonaut in 2012 and will be the second cosmonaut to fly aboard a SpaceX Dragon. Each of these crew members will be a part of Expedition 68 upon their arrival to the International Space Station. Now let's head over to Kate Tice for another status update on the countdown. How's it going, Kate? Thanks, Jesse. Uh, we're coming up to T minus 48 minutes and 40 seconds. The SpaceX launch teams are finishing final review of data from all the checkouts of Falcon 9 over the last hour. The launch director has confirmed with the launch weather officer that weather meets propellant loading constraints. So up next will be to pull the team for readiness, both to load propellant and to launch. That will be the final pull prior to liftoff. The seven SpaceX responsible engineers, often called REs, indicate that they are go by electronically voting on the online countdown procedure. The launch director, or LD, also checks with the Dragon mission director, MD, and the NASA launch manager to make sure they are ready. Earlier, you saw the vehicle assembly building called the VAB. The Falcon and Dragon launch team, uh, as well as key NASA launch members, are in the launch control center adjacent to the VAB. You can actually see where they are right now on the right-hand side of your screen. They have a view straight towards pad 39A through those large windows of firing room four. On your screen, you see there the Dragon capsule with the crew access arm still in the service position. The crew is on board Dragon waiting for the next instructions, which will be to stow the crew arm for launch and to arm the launch escape system. Once the launch director gives the final instructions to the launch team in that T minus 45 minute briefing, uh, immediately afterward, the crew arm sequence, uh, excuse me, the crew access arm sequence will be armed and initiated. We should get a good view of that access arm as it swings away from the capsule. That will take about two minutes to complete its rotation to move out of the way. The range continues to be go for launch. They continue to monitor uh, the clearance area around the launch pad, as well as the air and sea space around that uh, downward uh, uh, upstream or uh, the flight corridor downstream from uh, the launch pad. As we mentioned before, we have to make sure that uh, all areas are secure in the unlikely event of a, an abort. There at Kennedy Space Center, the conditions are predicted to be acceptable for launch. 
Um, you can, if we had daylight, you'd be able to see that uh, conditions are pretty calm. There's uh, 13 mile per hour winds from the south southwest, uh, so pretty mild all in all. The downrange landing zones, as I mentioned before, are also within uh, the conditions as needed, uh, if needed for an escape. So everything also looking go downrange. Now, in about a minute, we will hear the uh, briefing from the launch director. As I mentioned before, uh, the readiness poll that is uh, underway is the final go for propellant load and for launch. There on screen, you can see the four crew members of Crew 6 waiting patiently to go to space. Not much for them to do at this moment, but wait for that LD briefing, which will be coming up in about 35 seconds. As I mentioned before, the team in um, Mission Control, as well as the teams in Firing Room 4, they are basically collectively, both with NASA launch team and the Dragon launch team and the Falcon the launch team. The pull is complete team. and the team is ready for crew access arm retract, propellant load, and launch. Both control rooms are going to lock down at T minus 45 minutes and remain in that state until the launch escape system is disarmed. All operators are remain at their console and maintain a sterile cockpit until MD confirms successful disarming of the launch escape system following orbit insertion or propellant offload in the event of a scrub. For non-urgent no-go conditions, brief the CE or LD and they'll approve aborting the countdown. For urgent issues affecting the safety of the operation, operators shall call hold, hold, hold on the countdown net. Launch control will abort the launch auto sequence immediately and proceed into the launch abort sequence. At T minus 10 seconds, launch control will be hands off, relying on automated abort criteria for the remainder of the count. Launch control, you may proceed with arming the crown for movement. There we heard that final go for launch and prop load from launch director having started. And there we just heard the call out that the crew access arm retraction is underway. So let's head back to Daryl over at Kennedy as they have a live view of that retraction as it happens and uh, will be the major final physical reconfiguration of the pad prior to launch. Daryl? How's it going? Great, Kate, and uh, thank you very much as we watch the crew access arm move quickly at first and then rotate away from the Dragon spacecraft. There's the view from inside the crew access arm, the white room at the very end of it. As we can see, uh, the water tower out there. Hitting another milestone here, Raja, on our way to liftoff. Yep, and the, the crew is definitely tracking through all this on a, the timeline. Um, so they're uh, procedurally in 4.100, uh, following that SpaceX is retracting the crew arm and then starting to prepare uh, for the next big step they'll be taking is launching, or sorry, arming the launch escape system. And then looking forward uh, on the timeline to basically go through the steps for the prop loading. So we talked a little bit about the first, uh, the first broadcast, but uh, there's kind of a key mental note here as well. If there was an emergency pad aggress, uh, they probably have some crew coordination of who's going to get to the hatch first, but you definitely want to make sure the crew arm is back in place. So there's this period of time where the crew access arm is not there, the launch escape system is not armed. So crew access arm retraction complete. You need the arm to swing back to the capsule before you can actually egress. You need to make sure that's there before you, you step out critically important and we got some beautiful views from our flight operations team which is not only uh, making sure that uh, the area around the rocket is safe uh, but also giving us some spectacular views of that crew access arm uh, as it uh, retracted away from the rocket and there it is again right there yeah it's a, it's a great view where you can see the, the both the strong back which is the structural piece uh, holding the rocket uh, up there now and then the crew access arm swung back open now to the air and the atmosphere. Hopefully no dragonflies that far up. And 
We had our own dragonflies earlier, Raj. So <laughs> we're, we're working. We're, yeah, we're, we, we have successfully had good luck here at the, the launch broadcast okay, test. We've done feeling, our part. It's feeling good. We're doing it exactly doing what we can. There's a great view, too, of the trunk. So you can see the side, which is the part just below the capsule. That's got the, the avionics radiators for cooling. Uh, and then the left side that looks black in the picture here is actually the solar panels that generates the power for the, uh, the capsule on orbit. Curious, it looks like we saw a plane off there in the distance, and it could be pretty well off given it's dark at night. That might there. have been the helo out there potentially. Ah, too. very good. Good call. The countdown, T minus 41 minutes and counting, and uh, we're heading down to a launch time of 12.34 a.m. We saw the retraction. That's the last major visual milestone as we prepare for liftoff. Shortly thereafter, we should hear the call out that the launch escape system is armed. And then from there, Raja, we will hear that F9 prop load has started. Yep, and yeah, timeline-wise, I'd expect probably about uh, another minute and a half or two. They'll uh, they'll tell the crew to uh, they'll tell them to go ahead and step into the arming. Um, you'll see them putting visors down. You'll probably see them tugging at the restraint straps, just making sure everything is. Uh, extra tight, making sure you saw like Andre before was using his uh, stylus to probably edit some of the, the weather data they had on their iPad. They'll stow all those things and basically put themselves in a posture uh, where you could, you see even stowing it right now, um, where you could be in a posture where if the capsule were to initiate a launch escape, you'd be prepared for that. So from the time that is hot, you are pretty much sitting on a, uh, a live uh, set of Super Dracos that could go off automatically if the vehicle senses a malfunction once the prop loading starts or it could be manual issue, so you always want to be ready once that system's hot. Well, Raja, you say it, and then we see it. <laughs> Calling it out, remember well from your time as the commander of Crew 3. It's yeah. worth noting, you just came back from space. It was, what, May of last year? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's good to, good to be back. I'd, I'd, I'd go back in a heartbeat, but it's also good to be back home. But Oh, you're watching your friends go up? Yeah, this is... Uh, it's really surreal to have uh, you know friends and colleagues on the end of that rocket, and I think uh, you know it just reinforces the importance. You asked earlier, and the the, the the question was like, what do we do on our normal job? There's also people in our office. Uh, so Joe, who's the chief of the office, goes to the the launch trainers reviews, and you know you are signing up your friends to go ride this thing. So we take it pretty seriously as well. We should. You Crew can kinda, strapped in. Yep, you can see just by Andre's left leg, the red of that bag. We were talking about that earlier, but you couldn't Dragon see Dragon SpaceX, go for Section 6, close visors, arm launch escape system. All right, we're picking up Section 6 on closing the visors and, launch, and arming the launch escape system. All right, so you see them reaching up to the displays. They're stepping to that section of the procedure all verbalizing now with the visors down, that the Vox settings are correct so they can hear Space each other. Next, Dragon, visors are closed, we're arming the launch escape system. They have some telemetry on the display that shows them what the automatic thresholds are to make sure they're not violating one of those thresholds before they arm the system. We talked about that earlier tonight um, to make sure you don't inadvertently initiate a launch escape. And then we also talked about the flight computer stage, so that's what they're watching to actually know. So you actually hear the thunks because those valves that isolate the Super Dracos are in the capsule, so you can actually see like, where that NASA worm is and where the, the U.S. flag is. Yeah, those are the engines. Those are the engines, yeah, yeah. so you're, they're right by your head on the inside, so when you arm it, you can actually hear the sound of the valves opening up, and that's what allows prop to flow to the Super Dracos mm -hmm. in the event of a launch escape. Can you hear the prop flow as well? Uh, well, hopefully you never hear that sound. But oh, no, okay, <laughs> so it, it doesn't bleed in the system? No, or, no. Okay. It just opens the valve. Launch yeah. escape system is verified armed. There's the verification yeah. of arming of the launch escape system. Right on time with our milestones as we count down. And so for the crew, they're now closing out 4.100, which is their launch preparation uh, procedure. And they're now stepping ahead to what's the, the prop loading timeline on their displays, which is going to give them times of when is the, the different tanks are pressurizing and loading. There's no telemetry in the Dragon that tells you what the F9 tanks have in them in terms of amount of fuel. You can see what's in the Dragon, but not the F9. And so you rely on this timeline and the calls uh, from the team to know the status, and that gives you an indication based on the timeline you have of things are behind or ahead uh, or on timeline. The team on the ground can certainly see. Yes, absolutely, yeah. The ground team can see that all, uh, but that's not F9 all piped into the Dragon. Tank for propellant load. Oh, 
and we'll start venting. These would be the tanks on the ground. Right, so the, the, as they start to, the, they have what's called these giant accumulators that are full of the fuel that they then pump into the into the drag, into the F9. And the, the two things I learned on our, our first broadcast attempt, one is that the license plate changes every time. The, <laughs> the second that I also learned from you is that you can tell out here how full the rocket is by looking at the level that the condensation comes off the outside of the rocket, which you, uh, yeah, you can't see that on the inside, but that's a, a good technique for if you're watching on the outside and don't have the benefit of having the displays the crew has or the telemetry the ground has to just get a look at binoculars if you're standing on the causeway or on TV and know how full the tank is. Outdoor fuel gauge. Yeah. Only wow. if you launch in the humidity of Florida. I don't know if that'd work <laughs> in the desert as well. But. Well, we get, to we get to see launches out at Vandenberg, California, and uh, it's a little drier out there. It still is on the coast, so we have some humidity. But uh, it is quite a sight. It's a definite pro tip. I, I didn't know that. I've been, oh, well, <laughs> I've been in the office for five years. Uh, no, no one taught me that. I told so. an astronaut something. Yeah. No, I'm feeling proud. <laughs> but I tell you what, you haven't learned nearly as much as I've learned in my time uh, being in these two uh, launch attempts. And so happy you could come back and count this down. We know our astronauts all around the country are watching, checked in with Megan MacArthur earlier, had a nice little chat with her, she's watching. Other astronauts from the core, the astronaut core is roughly, what, about 42 astronauts? Yep, about that, yep. And then a, a new class called, the, they're named the Flies, the 2021 the class. The Flies, they, that's their name? halfway through their training, yep, and looking okay. forward to, they're cr crushing it the as you would expect. Started. And there's the call from the core. Yeah, here we go. So at this point, <coughs> all the closeout crew is not only off the tower, but outside what's called the exclusion zone or the hazard area, or different words for it. Basically, the, the radius away from the launch pad uh, since there's now prop flowing into the rocket. Well, T minus 34 minutes and counting until liftoff. Today we'll begin the next six month rotation mission to the International Space Station. As we've been documenting, we heard the launch escape system armed happened just before that propellant load began. Dragon capsule, it was loaded with its propellants about a week and a half ago, just a few miles down the road. In order to fly, Dragon needs a fuel and an oxidizer for the fuel. SpaceX uses monomethyl hydrazine, or what they call MMH, and nitrogen tetroxide, or NTO, for oxidizer. And together, these propellants feed those Draco engines that will maneuver Dragon on orbit it also feeds those eight Super Draco engines you were talking about that would power the launch escape system in an abort scenario. And so with that fueling having begun, that means those eight Super Draco engines inside Crew Dragon are ready. We heard, or rather Raja, relayed that the astronauts can hear those valves turning, getting that system ready to go should there be any kind of emergency associated with the rocket or the pad. Of course, NASA and SpaceX teams, they train extensively for exactly that type of contingency. And so with T minus 33 minutes and counting, let's head back over to SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California for an operations update from Kate Tice. Kate. Thanks, Daryl. I continue to follow along with the final minutes of the launch countdown, heading for on-time launch just under 33 minutes from now. Everything's still looking good for Dragon and Falcon 9. No major issues reported by the teams at this time. As we heard on the loops, the launch escape system is now armed, and Falcon 9 propellant loading uh, began at T minus 35 minutes. The first and second stages of Falcon 9 are each loaded with two liquid propellants. One is oxidizer, loaded into a tank at the top of each stage. The other, a fuel, loaded into a tank at the bottom of each stage. The fuel that we use to power the Merlin engines is RP-1, which is a refined kerosene. The oxidizer loaded on each stage is densified liquid oxygen, or LOX. Densified means it is kept much colder than typical for launch vehicles and takes up less volume, which allows for more oxidizer to be loaded into the first and second stages. And as Raja mentioned mo minutes ago, you can tell how full the tanks are based on how high the condensation appears on the outside of the vehicle. 
To ignite the fuel and oxidizer in the Merlin rocket engine, we use the ignition fluids of triethyl aluminum and triethyl boron, also called TTEB. When TTEB comes into contact with oxygen, it burns and produces a green colored flame. Once we have the flame going, we add the kerosene fuel into the Merlin chamber and the engine ramps up to full power. You might see the green flash just as the second stage engine ignites following stage separation two minutes and 48 seconds into flight. Now, for those of you who have been following along, you'll know that we stood down from our initial launch attempt of Crew-6 on February 26th due to a TTEB ground system issue. It was determined to be the result of a clogged ground system filter that was impeding the flow of TTEB. SpaceX teams replaced the filter, purged the TTEB line with nitrogen, and verified the lines are ready for launch. Lastly, we're topping, helium, uh, off, we're topping off helium into pressure vessels on both, the, on both stages. Um, that is actually used to pressurize the tanks in flight as the propellant is pulled out and consumed by the Merlin engines. Um, it's very similar to when you're drinking from a plastic Stage water bottle. Helium loading has started. And there's that call out for that cryo helium load I was just talking about. Um, it's similar to drinking out of a plastic water bottle. You got to let some air back into the bottle to keep it from crumpling. Now, on board the spacecraft, the astronauts are monitoring the systems while propellants are loaded into the Falcon 9 below them, as you can see on the right-hand side of your screen. The crew's training in the simulator here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, actually included playback of sounds recorded in Dragon capsules uh, during recent flights. So all of the sounds that they're hearing now, um, not only did they hear before in our previous launch attempt, but they heard it uh, during the training simulations as well. As for the range, they continue to report no problems and they are go to support launch. Weather also looks great. Uh, as I mentioned before, our probability of violation uh, for the launch constraints uh, is only 5%, so really good on that front. As a reminder, today we have an instantaneous launch time. So at this point, if we hear a hold for any reason, uh, we will have to stand down and target our backup launch opportunity tomorrow, just under 24 hours from tonight's planned launch. At this point in time, at just under T minus 29 and a half minutes, I'll turn it back over to Jesse and Gary for an overview of events that we'll see after liftoff. Awesome, thanks, Kate. For crew six, the astronauts' flight to station will take about 24 and a half hours. And as we wait for that T zero mark coming up in just about 29 minutes, the ground operations teams are doing a system series of system checks to make sure that both the Dragon and the Falcon 9 are ready for launch. You're going to be looking at a live view of our teams at the Cape as they prepare for liftoff. Now, as we wait for that launch clock to hit zero, we wanted to give you an overview of what the ascent portion of that mission is going to look like. Once we hit T0 and a successful launch occurs, we will watch Falcon 9 and Dragon lift off from historic launch pad 39A and make their ascent. At about 50 seconds into flight, Falcon 9 engines will throttle down to ha help pass through the period of maximum dynamic pressure on the rocket, or what we typically refer to as max Q. It's worth noting that once we hit that max Q point, the vehicle will be going supersonic. Once we are through the period of maximum dynamic pressure, we can throttle up our nine Merlin engines again. From there, at about two and a half minutes into flight, we have a series of three events that will happen in rapid succession. First is MECO, or main engine cutoff. This is where all nine Merlin 1D engines shut off in preparation for stage separation, which is our second event. This is where the first stage detaches from the second stage, with the first stage making its way back to Earth from landing, as the second stage continues on its journey with the third event, SES-1, or second stage engine start number one, where the MVAC engine lights up and propel propels the second stage, along with our Crew-6 astronauts, into orbit. As stage two heads towards its targeted drop-off orbit, stage one will execute two burns in order to make its way back down home on Earth. The first is the entry burn. That's where three of the M1D engines will reignite and then shut down again. Now this helps to slow the stage down in preparation for entry back into the Earth's atmosphere. And while the first stage is heading back to Earth, the second stage will cut off its one Merlin engine that was ignited right after stage separation. Once this happens, we'll wait for a confirmation of a good orbital insertion. 
About 90 seconds after Dragon gets into orbit, Falcon 9 will land back on Earth. The landing burn is just a single engine burn, but it's powerful enough to bring the vehicle speed down rapidly in order to land on our drone ship at about nine and a half minutes into the mission. And while the Falcon 9 first stage is landing, Dragon is preparing to separate from the second stage. At about three minutes after the second stage gets into orbit, we should have a great view of Dragon with its four-person crew drifting away from the second stage. Once Dragon is a short distance away, it'll begin checking out its Draco maneuvering thrusters to make sure Dragon continues to increase separation distance from the second stage. It's worth noting that these are not the super Draco engines that would be used during an abort scenario. About 40 seconds after separation, Dragon's nose cone deploy sequence will begin. It will take roughly four minutes for the nose cone hooks to unlatch and open, exposing its guidance navigation controls that will help Dragon autonomously fly to the space station. And lastly, once the nose cone is deployed, the remaining Draco thrusters on the forward bulkhead will be checked. From there, over the next 24-ish hours, Dragon will be in its rendezvous and approach phases undergoing a number of phasing burns as it makes its way to station. All of that will be coming up soon, but for now, let's check back in with Courtney in Mission Control Houston. Courtney. Thanks, Gary. The flight controllers here in Mission Control Houston are laser focused on the onboard systems of the space station, ensuring it is ready to receive Crew Dragon. They're also making sure communication links between the station, Dragon, and the ground are working properly, and the consistency to this point is that everything is proceeding right on track. Teams here in Mission Control Houston, the team in Hawthorne, and the astronauts aboard the space station will monitor the autonomous docking of the Dragon spacecraft on Friday. They'll perform a series of leak checks, then work to open the hatches on both the Dragon side and inside the station's pressurized mating adapter. We expect hatch opening to take place about an hour and a half after docking. Once on board, the the astronauts will be greeted by the space station crew and will then join in for welcoming remarks for the new crew members. From there on out, they will no longer be referred to as Crew 6, but rather as flight engineers of the International Space Station until their return back to Earth. Here at Mission Control Houston, Flight Director Judd Freeling is on console overseeing the team for launch. And that's it from here in Mission Control Houston, so I'll toss it back to the team in Florida. Daryl, how's it looking? We're looking great out here, Courtney, and thank you very much as we cruise around the set here. Our production team doing a great job showing us all the sights and the sounds of the countdown of Crew 6. Liftoff is at 1234 a.m. Eastern Time, and if you're just joining us, well, we're doing well. We're having a great countdown, 24 minutes to go for the sixth astronaut rotation mission to the International Space Station under NASA's Commercial Crew Program. Commander Stephen Bowen, Pilot Woody Hoberg, and Mission Specialist Sultan al Niyadi and Andrei Fedyev are strapped into the seats, as you can see them here inside Dragon Endeavor. The Falcon 9 rocket fueling operation well underway. The launch escape system is armed. And that means Dragon is prepared to launch itself away from the Falcon 9 in case of an emergency on the pad or after liftoff. So far, operations looking and sounding as we would expect. And you can see on the rocket, we're filling her up. The condensation of the warm, humid Florida air down there shows you that, uh, well, my guess would be about a third but uh, I have no actual <laughs> uh, telemetry to tell me that. Just going by uh, the condensation coming off the rocket. It really super chills the skin on the outside of the rocket, and then that, uh, that uh, you know, condenses the air in the atmosphere, the water that's in the air. And it really is something to look at once it's ready to go, all the way up and down the rocket. And, and the reason we make it, they make it super cold is, uh, you know, if there's probably, let's see, third or fourth graders out there. I know that's what my kids are learning about. It's like when something's really cold, it gets dense, so you can get more of it in there. So that's why it's important. You Every drop of gas matters when you're trying to get to orbit. Every You want as much margin. John was talking before about uh, why we build the timelines we do, and so, you know we always hope everything goes nominally, but we train for all kinds of contingencies. And so, um, you know, we've been talking about launch launch escapes, but the, the next phase is rendezvousing with the space station. And so we protect for, you know, a problem with either the station or the capsule and having to, you know, back away and come back again in 24 hours. And so all that requires prop and gas and the 
further and higher the F9 can get the Dragon, the more options we have. So that's why that's why they chill the gas. You heard calls earlier about the cryo helium, um, and like they talked about it uh, out at Hawthorne, that means that that we have enough gas to pressurize the tanks. Uh, and then next, you'll start tearing probably in about another minute. They'll start talking about uh, stage two fuel being loaded. And so you'll hear calls, uh, you'll talk, hear them talk about stage two and stage one, it's two stage rocket. So there's fuel and oxidizer for both the stages. Um, the first stage, like they described, having the nine engines and the, the second stage having one, but both of those require, have separate tanks for the fuel and oxidizer. And they'll, you'll hear them calling those out. Because again, the crew um, probably can't as much hear it like the same way they hear the Super Draco valves, but you can hear uh, sort of some creaking and some noises uh, some definitely some vibrations. So getting a call before that happens just kind of reassures them that that sound is expected and gives them a reference point on the time that they're following. We're about 37 seconds away from completing stage two RP1 load. In the meantime, let's tell you about the crew. The commander of crew six is Captain Stephen G. Bowen. He hails from Cohasset, Massachusetts. Married with three children, holds the title of first U.S. Navy submarine officer to be selected as a mission specialist by NASA. Captain Bowen is also a veteran of NASA space flights, including the space shuttle flights on STS-126, 132, and 133, the only astronaut to ever go consecutive back-to-back -back shuttles. Sitting next to Stephen is pilot Warren Woody Hoberg, the 37-year-old from Pittsburgh. He studied aeronautics and astronautics from MIT before getting a doctorate in electrical engineering and a computer science a degree from the University of California, Berkeley. During grad school, Hoberg worked as an EMT with the Yosemite Yer Search and Rescue. Crew 6 will be Stage Hoberg's. Stage 2, RP-1 load complete. And there's that load complete. Stage 2 is in the books. Loaded up. And now you can see the venting off of that uh, liquid oxygen. Talking about Hoberg, this flight will be his first flight since NASA selected him to be an astronaut along with Rajachari's class in 2017, the Turtles. In the role of mission specialist is astronaut Sultan al Niyadi. He was chosen by the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center of the United Arab Emirates to be a part of Expeditions 6869. Father of five spent most of his life in Al Ain and Abu Dhabi, but in 2020 traded that in for astronaut training in Houston at NASA's Johnson Space Center. This will be his first trip to space to space. And it's also the first trip for second mission specialist, Roscosmos cosmonaut Andre Fedyev. He will be working to monitor the spacecraft during the dynamic launch and re-entry phases of flight. He will be a flight engineer for Expedition 68, just turned 42 years of age. Each of these four crew members will be part of Expedition 68 once they arrive at the International Space Station. T minus 18 minutes and counting. We had strong back chill that began. And coming up in just a few minutes, we'll start loading liquid oxygen onto the second stage. Yeah, and I think a, a great testament to the international partnerships of this program. Half the crew is you know, international, Sultan being the first uh, UAE astronaut to launch on a U.S. vehicle from the U.S. to have trained at Johnson Space Center. Um, an amazing uh, you know, completion of the partnership that started several years ago and taking that now all the way to completion. Um, and just great to see you know, NASA and space exploration being just this great unifier uh, for the world, uh, especially as you know, there's low Earth orbit, but then we look beyond that to Artemis and, and Mars and just the, the collaboration and the work to do such hard things and really pulling together the best of, of all, our, all the nations. And the partnership of those nations rises above all else. And That's it's, uh, yeah. it's impressive, the camaraderie of the crews in space with their international backgrounds. So that venting, so we talked about there's two things happening. Dragon in the SpaceX, F9 is proceeding with prop load and we're tracking no issues with Dragon or F9 going into launch. SpaceX Dragon copies. So update from the core that's on track. So we talked about the condensation a few times, but there's also the venting, so two different processes. The condensation is the super chilled fuel cooling the, the metal and the skin around it. The venting is because it's super cold as it heats up on the inside just from the air temperature, you know, essentially 
working its way in there, it vents. And so that's just like a pot boiling, um, and just like you would you know, lift the lid off a tea kettle to let the pressure out, uh, this is the same thing you're seeing happen there. So that's what's happening kind of from the middle of the screen. Yeah, and, and on a calm night like tonight, the winds have totally died down. You can see it as it cascades down like a waterfall coming off uh, the middle of uh, the strong back there. Want to make a quick note about the, the radio and how you can hear if you're on uh, local amateur radio on the VHF radio frequency, turn into 146.940 megahertz and UHF radio frequency 444.925 megahertz on the FM mode. You can hear this all around the space coast. Load has started. And there goes our stage two locks load. On a beautiful night on the coast of central Florida. For stage one, that's going to continue to load, and we'll see that go all the way down to T-minus six minutes in terms of uh, the RP-1 load. In terms of locks, that will continue until about T-minus three to two minutes on the liquid oxygen side. A lot more volume, of course, in the first stage. Hey, let's throw up a quick social media question. What do you say, Raj? Sounds good. What do we got here? At JSE Garen asks, oh, I am nine years old and want to know if you can see airplanes on the ISS. I have never heard that question. So actually, uh, Megan uh, MacArthur had a cool post where she took a picture of the ground and you can see the contrails of a plane. So you can't see a plane if it's not what we call conning, meaning contrails. You can, if you can find the contrails, then you can follow it back to find the plane, but it's super hard to find an actual airplane that's not in the contrails. Um, we also spent some time on Crew 3 trying to see who could one-up each other to find ships. Uh, so you can cheat and look around the Panama Canal uh, to see if you could find ships there, but <laughs> you, you need binoculars to help yourself. But if you know where to look uh, or along the shipping lanes, you can usually find some from ships. And then airplanes, if you look around, uh, like the places like over the Atlantic where you can look for contrails and find planes, but absolutely you can see them. What a great answer. Didn't know that. Thank you, Raj. Let's head out to Kate Tice now. Thanks, Daryl. Everything's still looking good for launch of Falcon 9 and Dragon Endeavor just under 15 minutes from now. Now, for those just tuning in, Falcon 9 began propellant load at T minus 35 minutes. Around T minus 20 minutes, Falcon 9 completed loading of RP-1 fuel on the second stage. Fuel loading on the first stage remains underway. Um, and it is approximately 80% uh, full. Um, it will finish around T minus six minutes. Falcon 9 is also underway with loading of densified liquid oxygen. Uh, and that will wrap up at T minus three minutes uh, for the first stage and T minus two minutes for the second stage. Coming up, we'll perform checkouts of the thrust vector controllers, a procedure called TVC wiggles. We'll command Falcon 9 to activate those thrust vector controllers and actually wiggle the engines a couple degrees. This verifies that those engines will be able to move while in flight, which is how Falcon 9 steers itself during the ascent phase. Dragon mission director and team reporting no issues. Communication checkouts are complete, the crew access arm is retracted, and the launch escape system is armed. And as you can see there uh, on the right-hand side of your screen, the crew is strapped in and ready to go to space. Everybody looks pretty calm and chill, uh, you know, given that they are going to space in uh, 13 minutes. <laughs> Final instructions to the crew will come at T minus 10 minutes. The crew displays will be configured for launch, which give the crew insight into how the launch is proceeding and provides constant updates on vehicle health. At T minus five minutes, we'll then be in terminal count and Dragon will transition to internal power. We'll hear continued status call outs from SpaceX mission control as we get closer to liftoff. The range is go, all secured air and sea space remain clear. And as you can see, weather, weather remains gorgeous uh, and everything still remains inbound for the launch criteria. So all in all, Falcon 9 and Dragon Endeavor, all systems remain go for launch in just 12 minutes and 34 seconds from now. All right, thank you very much, Kate. And take a look at this picture. Before their flight, Crew 6 got a picture with what was supposed to be their booster actually got swapped out for a brand new booster, but anytime you get that close to the hardware, it's a cool thing. Brand new booster launching tonight. And at the time Falcon 9 and Dragon launches, 
The International Space Station, which is being tracked right here by Mission Control, will be 260 statute miles over the Bristol Channel, southwest of Cardiff, Wales. Crew 6, once they get off the ground, will spend the next 25 hours chasing down the International Space Station for a rendezvous at 1.11 a.m. Eastern Time tomorrow. It'll be Friday. And we'll have live coverage on NASA TV of docking and the Crew 6 welcome ceremony at 11 p.m. Eastern Time tonight. Final right. thoughts, Raja? Yep, so get ready to lift off. Yeah, so right here, they're uh, at 10 minutes. They'll probably say some thank yous to the ground. Uh, a lot of people got them here. Uh, you're going to see them messing with the displays. So Woody and Steve will be putting up what's called forward views on the outside displays so the mission specialists can monitor the parameters. That's how they monitor anything that would uh, how the performance is doing. In the center display, they'll bring up the event details uh, that show the launch, and you'll see them put their hands down once they get closer to launch, and they'll have this display up so they can basically watch. They'll have everything configured, and that's what they talk about configuring for launch so that you don't have to touch it during the launch itself. Colonel Chari putting us in the seat of the astronauts with exactly what they're doing. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And one more thing I want to say. I don't know, Raja. I have a feeling there's love in the air. Not going <laughs> to give it away, but it just feels like there's love in the air. you got to stay tuned to find out more about that. For now, we'll turn it over to Gary and Kate at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. Take us through the rest of the countdown. Thanks, Daryl. That's right. We're exactly t minus 10 and a half minutes until liftoff of Crew 6. Uh, as you can see there on your screen, Falcon 9 is underway with propellant loading, as indicated uh, by those white clouds forming around the vehicle. Uh, the fuel loading is complete on the second stage. LOX load remains underway. It's about 40 percent full on the second stage. Locks load also underway. Dragon, SpaceX confirmed crew displays configured for launch. SpaceX Dragon crew displays are configured for launch. Copy that, Steve. And once again, on behalf of the entire SpaceX team, we're honored to have you aboard Dragon Capsule Endeavor on its next trip to the International Space Station. We wish you a great mission, good luck, Godspeed, and enjoy the ride. And thanks again to everyone out there who made the vehicle, the ISS, our mission, and our crew ready for launch. Really want to thank everyone and appreciate the uh, great call, much appreciated call for the scrub the other night. Uh, it was a great uh, call and a good learning opportunity for the crew and I think for the teams. And uh, so once more to the breach, dear friends, Crew 6 is ready to launch. Some nice words there between the crew, as you see there on your screen, and SpaceX Core, uh, located here at SpaceX Mission Control, which a live view uh, there on your screen. As you can tell by perhaps the, the ambient noise around me, the energy is starting to grow uh, in anticipation for a launch coming up about eight and a half minutes from now. That's right, the energy is high here, Kate. Now at that T minus 10 minute mark, we heard the good luck and Godspeed from the teams here in Mission Control in Hawthorne, where that crowd is gathering. Meanwhile, we're tracking the loading of fuel and oxidizer on the first and second stage. Second stage filled with fuel right now, continuing to fill with oxidizer. It'll be the last of the tanks to fill. Stage one continuing to be underway. At the 10 minute mark, you heard that call for configuring the uh, crew displays for launch that was confirmed. At the T-minus 10 minute mark, it also is a point where Falcon 9 launch commit criteria gets checked by the computers past that milestone. Now we're counting down to the next milestone at T-minus 7 minutes, which is setting up for engine chill. That's right. We should hear that call out in about 44 seconds. Um, at T-minus 7 minutes, we will actually open up um, the pre-valves to the M1D engines, those nine engines at the base of the first stage. Um, that will allow a little bit of that super chilled, densified liquid oxygen to flow into the hardware, the, those turbo pumps. And that basically helps prepare the hardware from a thermal standpoint or a temperature standpoint uh, for that full flow of super chilled liquid oxygen. So um, we basically open up the pre-valves and a little bit of that 
locks, flows in, and helps cool the hardware down in preparation for a full flow of liquid oxygen. Engine chill has started. And as expected, there's that call out for that engine chill, indicating the pre-valves are open and the engines are beginning to prepare for liftoff. Now under six minutes, 45 seconds from launch, again, we're continuing to fuel the Falcon 9 rocket, stage two filled with the RP-1 kerosene. At the T minus six minute mark, we should hear a call out that the stage one RP load is complete. They're just topping that off. Liquid oxygen on both the first and second stages stage come next. RP-1 load complete. And there's that confirmation. We're counting down to T minus five minutes at this point. At T minus, T minus five, the, dr the dragon continue is configured for a terminal count. And at terminal count, Dragon is switched to internal power, right now receiving power from umbilical lines from the ground. Also at uh, just under five minutes, we'll be waiting for Strongback Retract. The arm that's currently propping the Falcon 9 and Dragon up, we'll see the clamp arm start to open and Strongback itself will tilt about two degrees off from where it is now at a 90 degree position. Just a little off, and then it'll get out of the way completely upon liftoff. Then of course comes the, uh, after the Strongback retracts, comes the completion of liquid oxygen uh, loading on both the first and second stage. For now, T minus five minutes, 15 seconds, we're gonna stand by for that call of configuring for terminal count. Crew six in their seated positions and ready for launch. Dragon is in configure for terminal count. Tanks are pressurizing for strong bay retract. All right, and we heard both of those calls. Dragon onboard computers are gonna take control of the vehicle should be seeing the clamp arm at the very top of the second stage, right underneath where you see the unpressurized trunk of Dragon, which is indicated by the half black and half white indicators, the black being the solar panels that provide power to the Dragon is on its transit to the International Space Station. Now that confirmation of strong back retract, we should be able to visually see that strong back. The strong back will retract about two degrees away from the vehicle. Then at liftoff, the strong back will actually go back to 45 degrees. That strong back is part of the transporter erector, which provides uh, the liquids and gases and uh, electrical connections to the vehicle. As Gary pointed out, those clamp arms opened up underneath the trunk, just above the first stage. And you can see that action happening now as that initial retraction, just a couple degrees away from the vehicle. At this point in time, fueling remains underway, excuse me, propellant load remains underway. All fuels are loaded, that RP-1 um, liquid oxygen load Stage should... one, lock flow complete. There, we just heard that call out that that is all done. Second stage, lock load still underway. That will wrap up at about T minus two minutes. Now that that first stage liquid oxygen uh, load is complete, we'll see um, some more of that white gaseous cloud forming around the vehicle. Uh, due to those lines being Dragon closed off. Dragon is in off. terminal count and on internal power. All right, good call out there indicating that Dragon is running on its own power. We are in the terminal count, now at T minus two minutes and 29 seconds. The crew remains comfortable there on the right-hand side of your screen. About 15 seconds remaining in stage two lock load.
Stage two, lock flow complete. Okay. Dragon is in auto idle. You heard those calls. The Falcon 9 fully fueled with RP-1 rocket fuel as well as the liquid oxygen. That call of Dragon is an auto idle. There's going to be a series gas of calls. Gas started. Expect lightning. There's the gas closeout purging the lines of the fuel that has supplied the Falcon 9 with RP-1 and liquid oxygen. We'll also wait for a call of the arming of the flight termination system. The Dragon flight computers are configured for launch. Flight termination system will allow Falcon 9 to talk to Dragon on the ride uphill. And terminate the flight, Falcon issuing an abort. Start up. Dragon is in countdown. T minus one minute and counting. Dragon is in countdown. Everything's looking good for launch. Dragon, SpaceX, go for launch. SpaceX, Dragon, copy, go for launch. T minus 30 seconds. T minus 30 seconds and counting. All teams pulled, go. Fifteen seconds. Ready for an on-time launch for the instantaneous one. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Engines full power and lift off. The crew six. Go dragon. Go power. Vehicles pitching down range, 1.7 million pounds of thrust provided by the nine Merlin 1D engines on the first stage. Hearing good calls, stage one propulsion is nominal. We're now at T plus 34 seconds into the sixth rotational crew mission on board Dragon and Falcon 9. Power and telemetry nominal. Stage one throttle down. So there we have heard the call out indicating that the first stage engines will begin to throttle down in preparation for max Q, which is the moment of maximum aerodynamic pressure that the vehicle will experience during flight. The vehicle is supersonic. That call out there indicating the vehicle's traveling faster than the speed of sound. Max Q. Stage one throttle up. All right, now that we're past max Q. One Bravo. Copy, one Bravo. That one Bravo indicator are different abort modes that are called that allow the ground teams and the crew to track about the position of the Falcon 9 and the Dragon as they make their way up the eastern seaboard. In the event of an abort, these different abort modes would indicate about the position where Dragon would land. Started as well as uh, indicate what series of maneuvers Dragon would indicate. But so far, we're hearing good calls on the performance of the Falcon 9 on its ride uphill. One minute, 53 seconds into flight. We're about 30 seconds away from main engine cutoff, which will be followed quickly by stage separation and second engine start which is the ignition of that MVAC engine on the second stage. Now about 10 seconds away from main engine cutoff. Two alpha. Copy, two stage alpha. Stage separation confirmed. There you can see on your screen confirmation of stage separation as well as ignition of that second stage engine. Second stage is now carrying the Crew-6 astronauts to orbit. Beautiful view there on the left-hand side of your screen coming from the first stage. 
which as you can see is still gaining in altitude. It has not yet uh, reached its apogee, a beautiful view of the Florida Space Coast there in the background. Meanwhile, we're tracking good performance on that MVAC engine. On the screen to your right, we'll be hearing periodic performance calls about once every minute for the status of the trajectory of the second stage and the Crew-6 astronauts that are inside Crew Dragon Endeavor. We'll also be that hearing call outs. Bermuda. Just like you heard just there, as we pass over the various ground stations along the ascent track. Dragon, SpaceX, nominal trajectory. And there's that performance call out. Dragon acknowledges nominal trajectory. As Hearing. for the first stage there on the left-hand side of your screen, that first stage still gaining in altitude, although um, that gain is slowing down. Um, it will be making its way back down to Earth, landing, uh, attempting a, a landing on our drone ship. Just read the instructions, which is located um, off the Florida coast by a couple hundred miles. The MVAC engine on stage two burns for six minutes after second stage ignition. We'll continue to see this engine burn until about eight and a half minutes into today's flight. Dragon, SpaceX, nominal trajectory. SpaceX, Dragon, nominal trajectory. Again, these performance calls happen once a minute. Flight team's continuing to track the Falcon 9 and its ascent. Everything's looking good so far. You'll also continue to hear those check-ins of the ground stations as we pass them. At this point in time, we're roughly two minutes away from the next major event, which will be the entry burn for the first stage. We will relight three engines, uh, three M1D engines on that first stage to help slow the vehicle down uh, as it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. We're approaching 200 kilometers in altitude. It's about 124 miles. Meanwhile, velocity. Dragon, SpaceX, nominal trajectory. Good trajectory calls. About to pass 12,000 kilometers SpaceX per hour. Dragon, nominal trajectory. It's about 7,500 miles per hour. Everything looking nominal for both first and second stages. Now coming up to T plus six and a half minutes into flight. Mostly what we're hearing now are the performance calls in the second stage. In about a minute is when we'll see uh, a series of events in rapid succession. It's been a pretty good pace since second stage ignition. Uh, about a, uh, less than a minute from now, we'll start to see Dragon, more action SpaceX, on the first stage. Nominal trajectory. SpaceX Dragon, nominal trajectory. As Gary mentioned, those callouts occurring about once every minute. Now we're about 20 seconds away from the first stage entry burn. That burn will last about 30 seconds and help slow the vehicle down as it re-enters back into the Earth's atmosphere. Stage one entry burn startup. And there you can see- Stage two, FTS has saved. On your screen, that first stage entry burn has begun. That booster sees high drag, which actually scrubs roughly 70% of the velocity by the time that the landing burn begins. So about another 10 seconds of this entry burn. Again, three engines relit, the center and two Stage radial engine engines. And conclusion of that entry burn. Meanwhile, good performance on the second stage. Since second stage ignition, we've been in a two alpha abort mode. 
The next abort modes will happen in rapid succession to Bravo, to Charlie, Delta, Terminal and Echo. Guidance. Each indicating different series of maneuvers in the event of an abort scenario, but as you've been hearing through the periodic checks, we're seeing good trajectory, good performance on the Dragon and Falcon 9. Seco, second stage engine cutoff, would be coming at 8 minutes 48 seconds. We're coming up on that event. Research, Dragon, Shannon. Shannon. Copy, Shannon. Now off the coast of Shannon, Ireland. Standing by for Seco. MVAC shut down. Stage one landing burn. And there we heard the call out indicating that landing burn. Dragon, SpaceX, we have a nominal orbit insertion. Great news there for. SpaceX Dragon copies nominal orbital insertion. Great Launch escape system disarmed. For Dragon Endeavor. Stage one landing lead deploy. Attempting to land on our drone ship. Just read the instructions. And there you can see on your screen, and also indicated by the cheers behind me, successful landing of this booster. It's first trip to space, and therefore it's first landing. An eruption of applause here at SpaceX Mission Control. And of course, after second stage engine cutoff, you heard that call that the crew is in orbit. They're now in a coast phase, where the second stage remains idle uh, for about three minutes before Dragon separates from the second stage. Meanwhile, you can see that first stage in the legs right on target. We're now getting views from the second stage. You can see this is one of the cameras that's pointing up into the trunk of Dragon. Of course, we're continuing to get views of the expansion nozzle at the end of the MVAC engine. But the crew is in orbit. The Falcon 9 has almost done its job. It completed its job uh, with propelling the astronauts through the six minutes of the second stage and, of course, the more than two and a half minutes of the first stage. Continuing in this coast period. We're heading to about the 12 minute mark after launch. So we're approaching 11 minutes right now. But it's great to see the crew in orbit. Uh, of course, we are waiting for that step separation. You can see this view right here of the MVAC engine, the second stage really in just an idle position, really just coasting, not many commands being issued from the Falcon 9. But of course, at the very end, we'll actually issue the command for separating the Dragon from the Falcon 9. You'll see a series, you may see a series of burns. The Draco engines uh, on the service section of the Draco will fire and uh, increase uh, separation distance from the second stage. Once again, live view there from the second stage looking up into the trunk, which of course is the unpressurized section um, that goes along with the Dragon capsule to the International Space Station. That's where we are able to store uh, basically cargo that is able to be exposed to the vacuum of space. So a great view there looking up into the trunk. That will be hopefully the first views that we get um, of that separation event, which we're expecting here uh, any second. There you can see on your screen confirmation. Dragon separation confirmed. Of that separation confirmed. Dragon Endeavor is now floating free in space. That's right, the Falcon Dragon, 9. Dragon, CE here. Welcome to orbit. Congratulations. Your flight is exactly four years after the flight of the Demo 1 mission. Like Andre said, all the best things take two tries. Happy that we could get you off tonight. Uh, if you enjoyed your ride, please don't forget to give us five stars. Over to LD for some words. Also, a friendly reminder to put your sushi orders in for CRS-27. Have a safe ride to the space station, and we look forward to seeing you when you get home. Thank you for flying SpaceX. Back to Los Angeles, Bermuda. And SpaceX Dragon copies all. That was fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Of 
crew, the crew six astronauts, of course, uh, having a strong bond. And SpaceX Dragon, we'd like to really for the great ride to orbit today. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. May have taken two rides, but it's two times, but it was worth the trip. And uh, I guess I'll pass it over to Woody for some words. Yeah, SpaceX Dragon, just want to say as a rookie flyer, that was one heck of a ride. Thank you. I would say put it as an absolute miracle of engineering, and I just feel so lucky that I get to fly on this amazing machine. Thanks to SpaceX, thanks to NASA, commercial crew program, and our international partners. Um, a lot of innovation went into this, tireless work effort, and a lot of pain painstaking attention to detail and focus on testing. And I think that's what makes it all possible to fly humans in space. Thank you. Some really nice words. Помогали в этом деле мне с тем ребятам. И я хочу сказать, что, что сегодня человечество делает еще один шаг в подготовке к новому большому скачку. И для меня огромная честь быть частью такой большой и дружной семьи, и величайшей международной команды, как Международной космической станции, работая вместе на благо всего человечества. Today, humanity takes another step. For next big leap, and for me, a huge honor to be part of such a big and friendly family and the greatest international team of the ISS, working together for all mankind. Thank you. Well said, everybody. Uh, allow me to say a few words in Arabic first. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله وصلنا الفضاء بس بغيت أشكر أمي وابوي وأشكر عائلتي شكرا القيادة الرشيدة وشكرا لمركز محمد بن راشد للفضاء اللي يعطوني الثقة هذه وكذلك أشكر كل من جهزنا ودربنا لهذه اللحظة التاريخية من مختلف وكالات الفضاء في أنحاء العالم شكرا لكم جزيلا شكرا سبيسيك لإصارنا الفضاء I would like to say thank you to, for everybody thanks to my parents my family thanks to our leadership the Mohammed Barash Space Center for their trust thank you for everybody who trained us and got us ready for this mission this is incredible launch with incredible amazing thank you so much and last but not least thank you NASA thank you SpaceX for flying us to space. Go Dragon, go SpaceX. And allow me to introduce our fifth crew member. His name is Suhail, and Suhail is the Arabic name for the star Canobus. And in the Middle East, we anticipate the appearance of Canobus because it marks the end of summer and the beginning of cool time. And Canopus is actually the second brightest star in the night sky. And this is the second flight for uh, Suhail, because he flew with uh, astronaut Hazan Mansouri in 2000, 2019. And many people think Suhail is uh, an, al an alien, but to me, he's on Earth in a space suit, but with high ambitions. Thank you once again, and talk to you from the ISS. And Dragon SpaceX, we copy all those words. Uh, at this time, I can provide you an update that uh, we had nominal dehumidifier activation and service section Draco checkouts. Uh, for your awareness, uh, on hard capture hook five, we did swap to backup motors. So you'll see that the uh, nose cone opening did swap to backup. However, all hooks did indicate that they were traveling and look good on backup. Position yeah, 
All right. Very dynamic time. Um, of course, the Falcon 9 delivering the Crew 6 astronauts into orbit after the nine minute ascent. We heard those great congratulatory words from each and every member of Crew 6, who of course had a strong bond with the teams here in uh, Mission Control and SpaceX. Uh, that call you did here to the crew was about the nose cone. Uh, the nose cone is deploying now. They were troubleshooting an issue with one of the hooks, but switched to backup motors, and we're seeing that nose cone deploy now. Uh, but Crew 6 is now on its way to the International Space Station. It's going to take about 24 and a half hours, so they'll go through a series of checks, a series of initial burns, and then eventually have a sleep period before waking up and really getting into the action uh, with a lot of the burns that bring it closer and closer to the International Space Station. It'll be docking to the Zenith port. We're now getting views from the Dragon, and that's the nose cone deploying that you're seeing right now on the end of the dragon. And Kate, this really sets the uh, crew up for some of the major burns here. That nose cone deploying reveals the four forward bulkhead Dracos that do a lot of the heavy lifting, a lot of those significant burns that bring the crew closer to the International Space Station. That's right. The nose cone is basically the pointy end at the top of Dragon. So now with that being exposed, those forward bulkhead thrusters uh, will be able to do their job um, as Dragon Endeavor makes its way to the International Space Station. Um, just prior to losing the ground station coverage, we were able to catch a quick glimpse of the zero G indicator. Um, I always love seeing that be revealed uh, as it's always different for each crew and it's always special to the crew members. Um, so I love the words that were shared around that. And I personally have a strong connection to this capsule. This was the Demo 2 capsule, the Crew 2 capsule, the Axiom 1 capsule, and now the Crew 6 capsule. And so um, it always brings a, a lot of uh, pride and joy to see this particular capsule fly in space safely once again. So with all that being said, let's head back over to Daryl and Raja, who saw all of the, the, the liftoff action live. You guys, I bet it was incredible having seen it from the press site myself a couple of times. I know you can feel it. Tell us how it was to see this crew lift off. Absolutely, Kate, and uh, thank you for the toss back here to the Kennedy Space Center. And on that point, we got to get Raj's reaction first because it was his first launch. He's he's been on a <laughs> rocket. He's been to space. Let's see the outside. First time watching a launch. Yeah, that, that was awesome, Daryl. Uh, it was uh, better than I expected. So I think uh, much uh, a much more throaty rumbling sound once it started to pitch over uh, and a beautiful night here so we could see the second stage light we could actually see the throttle down for uh, from stage one to stage B which was really cool uh, saw the separation saw the light go out when the first stage separated saw the second stage light and got to watch it uh, all, pretty much all the way to two Bravo it was it was pretty impressive to so two that, Bravo what, yeah. what, what, sorry those are those are different launch escape phases so yeah it was uh, it was awesome seeing it from the ground and just kind of thinking through what that ride was like a while ago. But, uh, I'd, ra I'd rather be on the inside, <laughs> the outside, <laughs> but it's pretty. Here with us, <laughs> but it's pretty. It's pretty impressive uh, from both views. Yeah, it was, well, it we're was so cool glad to see them. And exciting, that, yeah, exciting that they're on the way to the space station. Um, so happy for them. No doubt. Congratulations to not only the crew that is getting up into space, but also everyone who helped make it possible. It takes an, an, a tremendous number of people in order to pull that off. And that roar, right? When did you feel it in your chest? Yeah, so on the, the day of, the you can, yeah, here, it, it, you can feel it there and you can feel it here. You'd actually feel the vibration. They can actually bodily, you know, it's actually vibrating your body, Visceral, the, the, the yeah. ground around you. And I think just the coolness of it, almo it's almost daytime around the launch pad when it first lit. Just with the humidity, uh, the temperature dew point spread right now, there's a lot of moisture in the air. So just the reflection of the light, you actually couldn't even see the top of the rocket. It was the flame, the, the plume lit up the whole horizon. So basically as far as you could see, 180 degrees here just looked like daylight for the first about 20 seconds. So it was really, really cool. Well, your first launch, watching. Yep, I'll be back Sir? again. Yeah, we're ready to see another one. <laughs> we love it. Fantastic. All right, um, as I mentioned before, we got to the you know terminal count and ascent. I said there was a little bit of love in the air, right? Well, why is that? Well, a gentleman by the name of Sabi Farouk brought his girlfriend to the Banana Creek launch viewing location and proposed to her right at liftoff. They're both from Denver. 
we have a picture, and there it is. There's Sabi and his girlfriend. Now fiance. And now fiance. Yeah. Tamori. And she's sporting the ring. Congratulations to them. What a, what a special thing to do. He had planned out this because during their, uh, when they first met, they had their first kiss at a rocket launch. And so he wanted to bring <laughs> her back to propose. And it happened right here at the NASA Kennedy Space Center. What a neat love That's story, cool huh? Yeah, what a great story, yeah. Congratulations to both of them. And so now let's turn it over to Jasmine, who is with a special guest with some post-launch reaction. Jasmine. Thank you so much, Daryl. Here on the balcony of OSB2, we had a great view of launch and the crowd around us just erupted in cheers. It lit up the night sky. Joining us now is Kennedy Space Center Deputy Center Director Kelvin Manning. Thank you so much for being here. Well, it's great to be here, Jasmine. We are so glad to have you. And Kelvin, first question is easy. What did you think of launch? It was spectacular. And <laughs> anytime we're putting people on a rocket makes it even more special. So. We launched satellites, we launched all kind of things, but tonight it was Steve, Woody, Sultan, and Andre um, watching them walk out, saying goodbye to their families, and uh, for us to get them off safely onto the International Space Station, that's a huge accomplishment. It really is a huge accomplishment. Daryl just mentioned love in the air, and we saw that great proposal at uh, Banana Creek, and Commercial Crew is really the perfect marriage of our commercial and our international partners. Isn't that right, Kelvin? Absolutely. So government, industry, and, and international partners, it's kind of like a modern day what we strive to have like Star Trek. You have all these people from different planets and uh, we're just getting started here. So maybe one day we'll have uh, people from other planets as well. <laughs> We really are just kicking things off. And you mentioned, you know, the, the astronauts flying on today's mission and that you've actually uh, been on the selection panel for a few of the astronaut classes before. One of those was the turtles. So pretty exciting for you to get to see uh, Woody fly today, right? Oh, absolutely. Uh, special guy and um, really looking forward to seeing him on orbit and then getting him back home and, and hearing his stories. Yeah, we're, we're looking forward to having him back as well as uh, the rest of Crew 6. And this was really a great way to kick off the launches of 2023. We mentioned earlier with Janet Petro that we are looking at over 90 launches this year. So what else is going to station in the next few months? Okay, we got a cargo resupply mission, CRS-27. We have uh, Boeing's inaugural flight of the uh, crew flight tests, uh, looking for Sonny and Butch to sometime this spring to fly the CST-100 Starliner to station. That's a huge deal. And we got uh, another commercial uh, Axiom mission that'll go to the, the space station. And then we'll look at Crew 7 to follow these guys in another six months or so. Wow, a lot of work going on here at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, Kelvin, any final words of thanks that you want to give to the workforce here? Yeah, it's all about the team. And this is America's space program. You talked about our industry partners, our other government partners, and our international partners. Uh, we have a lot to be proud of. And like we said, we're just getting started. So thank you, Jasmine. Of course, and this really is the dream team. We appreciate you being here tonight, Kelvin. Okay, All right, Daryl, back to you. Thank you so much, Jasmine. And you see her working the love in there with the CCP. <laughs> well done, thank you very much. Well, the crew is on the way to the International Space Station. We did hear uh, from the SpaceX team that the nose cone hooks at the top of the spacecraft, right? Yep. The Dragon, um, they went to the backup motors in order to release that nose cone. That's pretty critical to make sure you get that up. Great redundancy with the system there. But why is that so important that that nose cone comes off? Yeah, so we you can't dock to the space station without the nose cone. So the as we saw, just looking at the views of the capsule before uh, liftoff, it's closed for aerodynamics because you don't want uh, the door wide open while, you, while you're flying through the air. Once you're in space, of course, there's no drag, so then you can open that up. Um, and uh, that exposes the camera and the sensors that allow the Dragon to dock with the International Space Station. There's a whole lot of stuff going on, so the crew was working the comms back down to the ground and monitoring a whole bunch of systems, so we saw the separation. Uh, they have telemetry that gives them information about that, and then uh, the next step is the nose cone deploy, and as you heard the core mention, all of those hooks, uh, there's a dozen hooks, to, uh, six of them uh, are holding the nose cone, there's, and then basically each of those hooks has backup and primary motors, so what you heard 
them describe as one of those went under the backup motor to open the hook, which is why we have backup motors. Uh, now with the nose cone open, they should be good to continue to the uh, the space station. Um, and next thing they'll be talking about is, is phasing burn, so we, you know, how they have to catch up. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure there'll be teams looking at uh, the data from that to see if it was kind of like we talked about earlier in the broadcast. Was it actually a problem with the primary motor, or was it just a bad telemetry? Uh, so the ground has some ability to to suss that out with some extra data they have. They can try resetting things. So my guess is when they go to actual docking, they may retry that primary motor just to see if it's working, and then they have the backup oh. motor still as a, an option. Um, so they still have the redundancy, but uh, they'll sort through uh, maybe troubleshooting that some more, but I don't think it should affect the, the follow-on. So those on. hooks are used when they dock? Right, the same, yeah, the same hooks. Uh, there's Mechanism. a soft capture and a hard capture, mm -hmm. a hard hook system that d attaches them to the space station. But again, as long as hard capture, mm -hmm. a hard hook system that d attaches them to the space station. But again, as long as the backup motor's working, it should be fine. Should be good to go. Yep. All right, well, we will track it all along the way and we know we saw a visual confirmation of the nose cone coming off. Yep. Saw that right on the video with the cameras that SpaceX has. And so now, Stephen, Woody, Sultan, and Andre are on course to arrive at the International Space Station around 1.17 a.m. Eastern Time tomorrow. And of course, NASA TV will be wrapping up our coverage, but you can follow along with Crew-6's entire ride to the station and hear real-time audio from space to ground on our mission audio stream on YouTube. Just look for the link on NASA social media accounts and in the description of the NASA YouTube launch broadcast. And though our coverage here at Kennedy Space Center is concluding, Crew-6's mission has only just begun. And you know it well, Roger, when you go up into the International Space Station, you really enjoyed the ride getting there because that's when the work starts. Exactly, yeah. So it's actually a really nice period of time here. You got some time to look out the window, uh, enjoy your time. You spent a lot of time in the sim, the Dragon sim, whether it's out at Hawthorne or the, the ones out in Houston. Um, but it's nice to actually you know, now enjoy the ride uh, and take it all in, especially for the, the three rookies. Get used to some space adaptation, moving around in, in microgravity before you get on the space station. Because as soon as you show up on the space station, man, it is busy. <laughs> it is fun, but it is busy. Time to get to work. Next up is our post-launch news conference scheduled for 2.30 a.m. Eastern Time on NASA TV. We'll have a live joint docking coverage. Uh, of Crew 6. We'll have the welcome ceremony starting at 11 p.m. Eastern Time tonight. Uh, this is, is this will be on Thursday on NASA TV as well as SpaceX's YouTube channel. And you can find mission updates on Twitter, at NASA, at SpaceX, and on the web at nasa.gov, including that link. We'll have it in there in the description of the mission audio stream if you want to stick with Crew 6 during their entire journey to the space station. Well, before we want to sign off here at Kennedy, I want to thank Raja Chari for being on the launch broadcast and sharing your incredible experiences. I learned such an incredible amount. I hope our audience did too. You answered all their questions, and it was fascinating <laughs> just to listen to all the things that happened. Really appreciate well, you being thanks. there. I'm, I'm glad I got a chance to see a, a rocket launch. And so, yeah, I highly recommend coming here to do this. So you can get a great view of a rocket launch. It's the way to go. Great plug for the Kennedy Space Center there, Roger. We appreciate that. And good luck to you on your work with the HLS. You're doing uh, a lot of work there with the human landing system for the Artemis program, and people are really excited about that. Yeah, they should be. It's, it, it's an amazing time. We've, we're seeing what we're doing in low Earth orbit, and that is just the first step, man. We are going back to the moon to stay and onto Mars, and it is a great time to be in space. Congratulations on watching your first launch, and congratulations to the space lovebirds out there at the <laughs> Kennedy Space Center who tied, or well, at least had, had the proposal and got a big yes. And then, of course, thanks to all of our guests for joining us today. We really appreciate you watching. You, is, you are why we do this, right? So here now are some highlights from the journey to orbit off the Earth for the Earth. For Rajachari and everyone here at the NASA Kennedy Space Center, I'm Daryl Nail. Have a great night and keep looking up. Crew 6 on the move inside astronaut crew quarters. Crew 6, walking outside of astronaut crew quarters for the second time. Andrei Fedyev, Woody Hoberg, Stephen Bowen, and Sultan Alnayat. The crew departing the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building, the full security escort across NASA's Kennedy Space Center to launch pad 39A. The commander and pilot, Stephen and Woody, making their way inside Dragon.
There go our two mission specialists. As they cross the hatch, be very careful. It's five point harness just to save wear and tear on the suits. A lot of times the ground crew will, will help with doing that. As we watch the SpaceX closeout crew close the hatch to the Dragon capsule. Three, two, one. Engine's full power and lift off. Crew six, go Dragon, go Falcon.